Today on the Fast Life Podcast, we have a special guest, Todd Bluebaugh. I'm excited to have him on. Todd has been a massive inspiration for me during the past year. His book, Too Far Gone, made me realize there is so much more inspiration to be found beyond Instagram and social media. Todd is a true artist and his work in illustration, photography, podcasting, and cinematography is all inspiring. So let's get into this episode with Todd Bluebaugh. Over the past year, Cowboy Harley Davidson has been putting in the work to help bring together various aspects of the motorcycle culture within the Austin, Texas community. They have supported not only the podcast, but also many local bike events and shows, including our FXR tour. I want to express my gratitude to the entire staff at Cowboy Harley for their support. I've had the pleasure of purchasing two bikes from Cowboy Harley Davidson in my lifetime. Most recently, I bought a Lowrider ST, which was dialed in with a few custom parts that I pretty much got to have on every bike. Whether you are in the market for a new or used Harley Davidson or looking to get your motorcycle customized, repaired, or simply maintained, you can count on their professional parts and service departments to get your bike dialed. To get in touch with them, you can visit their website, cowboyharleyaustin.com, or simply drop in and start a conversation about your next or even your first Harley Davidson. And don't forget to give them a follow on the gram to stay up to date with all the other happenings and events going around in the Austin, Texas area. I have been using Lexan Moto products for the past six years, and they have been an integral part of my riding experience. My journey with them started with their original FT4 headset and tire pump, but now I've upgraded to their top of the line Novus headset, which features 40 millimeter Lexan Plus speakers, CVC and DSP noise cancellation technology. With the Mesh 3.0 power technology behind it, I can connect with up to 32 riders on any given ride. Their new P5 Advanced Smart Tire Pump is a must-have for every biker. I always keep one in my garage, and it comes in handy during long trips if my phone battery or tire pressure is low. For more information on these fantastic products, check out their website, lexan-moto.com, and don't forget to use the offer code FASTLIFE at checkout to save you 15% on your order. And lastly, head on over to Instagram and give these guys a follow at lexanmoto. Hey guys, you ready to let the dogs out? Life podcast. How do you do it? I'm, I'm an open book. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for opening up this book for me. Um, no, so, yeah. I, first off, Todd, I'm, I'm a huge fan uh, as, not in, not as of 2023 20, huge fan. I, I, I found you through the podcast that you did for Dan. And that, that uh how you kind of edited and, and chopped up that first like kind of more like a scissor reel version of the podcast it it knowing dan it was who he was in like i felt him like a true him through the way you uh made that video or that uh just made that i don't even know what the hell the word to say is it just made me like feel him through that video podcast that you had made that's it man no that's all i want to do it's nice to hear that like that's that's great yeah Um, because the the best thing i can do with the tools that i have is try and represent people accurately yeah the way that they they maybe see themselves to to a degree but then there's a way that the world sees them too that I think it's important to show. The thing that I don't want to do is show just kind of the um, the exploits of of party and of mm. you know all the the burnouts and keg stands, whatever. That's fun. That's great. That's chopper parts yeah. of chopper life. But there's so much more. It's yeah. almost everything else. The kid talking about his kids and everything, like I said, you really nailed that. And now, and now that you're saying that, it makes sense. And I think that's inherent in what being a photographer does. It makes you start to see beauty in people from the outside looking in, you know, or not not a surface value, but you you see your friends and angles that are badass and you want to show them how you see them through, you know, these different ways, if you will. That's just beauty. You yeah. know, that's just like, how do you not is the exact equation any artist has to figure out is what is your eye telling you? Mm. And, um, I'm a pretty sensitive person. So yeah. I, I like to show people how I see them. Yes. 
but also how they see themselves. And there's some interpretation that you kind of have to spend some time with that person and kind of get an understanding of what is making them tick beyond the surface. Mm -hmm. And then there's another layer too, that usually comes out later after all the guards are dropped okay, and, and, um, you've really made progress at that point. In yeah. fact, like one of the, one of the, the, I, uh, one of the moments I wish I would have been hitting record, um, was after my podcast with, with Detroit mm -hmm. and we were sitting here and we had a great talk. It was just flows all very natural. Yeah. And then, you know, we said our goodbyes and I clicked the off and then we, we started talking about his dad. Mm. He started telling me about the time his dad told him that he loved him yeah. because he had been telling his dad that he loved his dad. Um, you know, every time he said goodbye, but his dad would never say it back. Oh. And then he told me about the one time he, he said it back to him. And uh -huh. we both kind of were just like, <laughs> yeah, you know, and I was like, fuck, I wish I would. <laughs> yeah. But it, it took three hours of talking yeah. to get to that one soundbite that I didn't end up getting, but I did get there personally Yeah, yeah. with Detroit. And, you know, to this day, I consider Detroit one of my, you know, he's such a wise person. Mm -hmm. He's a great talker and he'll talk and talk and, and do a wonderful job of telling stories and, you know, um, being an ambassador, almost like a, 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 a diplomat, right. Yeah. For what we do. But then there's this other layer of him with his family that is so wise and, uh, I'll call him for advice on anything. Yeah. Cause he's like that, that father figure, you know? Mm. So like I was saying, you know, you growing up in Kansas essentially, right? Where does photography like start to dig into you? Oh man, that started very early with me because of my mother. Yeah. And she was a fine artist, um, an exceptional painter, mm -hmm. you know, started with drawing. She's very great uh, with uh, charcoal, pen and ink. Mm -hmm. And um, she moved on to painting and uh, she was great. Um, Oil-based, acrylic, watercolor, that's yeah. what she did and she lived it and she shot all of her own reference material from okay. photographs. Yeah. So the camera was, was never an art in our house, but it was a tool. Mm. And, um, my understanding of photography kind of came from exploring how you shoot reference material for an illustration or a painting. Okay. And, uh, which is essentially what David Mann was doing with a lot of his paintings it, as well. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I still, I'm probably my most, I'm mo most passionate about illustrating. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite thing to do. And I have fucking unfinished <laughs> illustrations all over my office um, that eventually I would like to turn into something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just don't have time to sit down and do them sadly. But, uh, my exploration of photography came from shooting reference material. And, uh, I think that's a really great way to learn it Yeah, because when you're composing something two dimensionally on a page, you really is specifically in black and white or pen and ink. You really have to calculate where things overlap and what is pushed and what is pulled. Mm -hmm. Essentially composition in photography is exactly that. Yeah. You know, the, the first thing that I look at when I'm taking a photograph is the background and where there's a hole in the background is where you're going to place your subject. You know, maybe it's where the horizon dips down yeah. or, or where there's a pocket in the leaves, what, whatever it may be. That's the same way you draw. You yeah. Know, you create that space in the composition. And from there, you know, you move from composition, you move on to lighting, which, uh, lighting accentuates a lot of the edge work and value of where you throw a shadow to push something back or sh uh, an edge light to sharpen something to come up. Yeah. And so when I was drawing, I was doing all that and I didn't realize it. And then when I started learning to shoot reference material photographs, I was like, Oh my God, this is so much easier. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I could, I could understand it. I remember the, the first time I ever really cracked the code, you know, I was probably like 
11 or 12 mm-hmm. and my mom was in the backyard and we had this big field and there were these, um, there were these, uh, oh gosh, what do you call them? Milkweeds. They grow about, you have milkweeds and I think so. They, they, they grow about head high, sometimes taller, depending on how much rain you get. Yeah. And they have this bud on them and, and they, um, they have a silk oh, material yeah, yeah. that floats in the air. Yeah. Right. And so the, the light was behind the row of milkweeds and it was, so it's backlit. Right. Uh-huh. And it's catching these milkweed pods and they're just glowing. And I'm like, Oh, I get it. You know, the backlighting and yeah. it pop you something off. And then I was like, but if I take a picture of my mom against the milkweed, she's in the shadows. And I was like, I need a mirror. So I went in the house and I fucking blasted my mom with a mirror, you know, like, yeah. Oh, to almost like you know, bounce the light. Just yeah. like you would do in movies, yeah. you know, and I learned this much later when I, when I was in school, but, um, I thought I had cracked the code. I was like, oh my God, yeah. I, I did it without a flash. And, and that was the first epiphany I had where I considered photography as like this, you know, it, it was, it was more than a tool. It was something you could kind of just accomplish. Yeah. If you wanted to light someone in a shadow, there's a way to do that. And there's a way to manipulate the light. And my head was just, yeah. It, the creative, there's a creativeness to that where you can, you know, you're making an idea come to life. Yeah. Right. So it's engineering. Yeah. yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you're doing this all through Kansas and whatnot. And so did you, go attend a school for photography or was it more graphic design or I, I did all of it. Yeah. In my arc, I started in film as in movie. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it was also, then it was broadcast and, and kind of all inclusive, but I realized very quickly the amount of money it takes to make it in that. And, yeah. and some of the, and not to, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not discouraging anybody from trying, but a lot of the, students in that program were, were very well off. And I'm hearing them talk about senior projects and, you know, yeah. sp- spending a hundred thousand dollars or whatever uh, on yeah. there. And I'm just like, this isn't realistic. So I went into photography Yeah, and I did, um, you know, two years of the program before it switched from a, uh, wet base, you know, chemical lab to digital Mm-hmm. And I was losing a semester in that period. So then I went, you know, to, to graduate on time, I transitioned into a degree called visual concepts, mm-hmm. which put me back into illustration and design, which okay. I didn't mind doing. Cause I love that too. Yeah. So by the time I graduated, I had kind of gone like in a full circle from, um, you know, motion to photo all the way back to you could look as a very well-rounded education it in, was. in that yeah yeah i think i was lucky because i use all of those things yeah in in what what i do now having a brand like arlen s support the fast life podcast is absolutely surreal decades before i fell in love with motorcycles the nest brand was right there innovating and inspiring generation after generation the brand's long-standing history and dedication to the custom motorcycle industry is truly remarkable I've been fortunate enough to use many of their products on my Rogue Glide, Lowrider ST, and FXR Chopper over these past few years. I love their four and six piston brake calipers, wheels, and bagger mid controls, and I use Arlen S air cleaners on all my bikes. And even after thousands of miles, the parts still look and feel new. If you're interested in learning more about the Arlen S motorcycle products, head on over to arlenss.com where you can find out more information and see their vast catalog. And for our listeners, if you drop the Fast Life 10 offer code at checkout, you're going to save yourself 10% on your order. And don't forget to give these guys a follow on Instagram at Arlen's Motorcycles to stay up to date with all the happenings around the brand. Now let's get back to the show. And yeah, I've, so doing that, did you, was, what school, where'd you, did you travel University out? of Kansas. Okay. So yeah. you were still somewhat local yeah. to uh, Topeka, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was in Lawrence, Kansas is where that school was. It's a great school, it you is. know, and I, I still love going back there and going back to that campus. And, um, for the money, I think I got, probably got just as good as an, ed- of an education as any art school that mm. costs four times as much. Yeah. I Plus I had a scholarship. So I was like, it was a no brainer to stay in state. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I wish that, you know, I, I didn't, I grew up 
artistically, not autistically, artistically. Uh, <laughs> I grew up autistic. Yeah, I kind of did. Too. <laughs> um, I was always into creative. Like I, I, I used to draw. Like you know, I played sports growing up, so I was you know. And I'm also of the era of the Air Jordans, so I'm like drawing shoes. What I year think were you born? I'm 82. Okay, I'm 80, so we're okay, right there. So I remember, yeah, that sneaker era was a big kick. Yeah, and you remember, I I grew up in the city, so yeah. I was much more urban schools, much more, you know, it's it took a while before I was allowed socially to listen to like, you know, uh, you know, Nirvana and yeah. all that stuff. It just kind of was one of those things that you kind of had to fit into the society that you kind of lived in. Right. Yeah, totally. Um, but, uh, through all that, that just the, the creation of shoes and there seemed to be so much emphasis in like a really innovative designs that are still the most popular shoes today. It's so true. That you know? era was the, probably the, the, um, Oh, what would you put it? It was just the cornerstone yeah. of classic design for footwear. What's crazy is coming off of the most basic things ever in your original Converse's and, uh, you know, basketball Converse's and Adidas and, and what was kind of popular from, you know, the invention of the sneaker to yeah. 1990, essentially. Yeah. And the technology that started coming out, the 90s were like, I mean, they're a little bit too wild of a shoe for me to wear today, but in, back then it was like, that was kind of like your social cred, you know, was it was to have like a pair of Air Maxes or Jordans or said, said athlete. Right. Yeah. Um, and those are the shoes that all of, I feel like most of the designers, ones that are doing well anyway, are kind of emulating now. Yeah. yeah. So it's, a, it's a very, it's, it's crazy how different worlds, the, the artistic nature of those worlds you hit these like Goldilocks time periods that kind of become the staple of all creativity outside of that past it. Right. You do. You really you know? do. Yeah. And, um, you know, being, a, being into that, it was that, then it was, com or before that it was comic books, just trying to redraw the things that I was in, you know, I loved it. Was, I mean, when I got into basketball, man, I would like sit there and hand draw like uh, you know, from a poster or a magazine like Jordan. Oh, or, dude, I did the same thing. Yeah, yeah, just trying to, not knowing how how people do it in the art world, but just you know, trying to just get good at yeah hand eye coordination with seeing the proportions and you know one of the best things I ever learned in school that I actually learned I use a lot today is like perspective drawing. You mm -hmm. know, when I'm designing paint jobs or uh, you know, I usually draw the bike. To, to, to lay out and then, and then I'll print it yeah. or I'll copy it and make prints and then I'll color it in like a, for a paint job and color scheme ideas. Yeah, totally. Having, having that two and three point perspective understanding can yeah. communicate a concept immediately. Exactly. It's a very valuable skill to have. And it's kind of lost, you know, draftsmen now work, um, you know, some of them still, still work by hand, but they'll draw three dimensionally on, whatever program. Yeah. AutoCAD. Yeah. Something like that. There's so many of them, which is an incredible tool. Cause you can then print from any angle, but there's something that's really lost in that yeah. transition from your concept in your head to 2d. Yeah. And that's, that's great that you have that skill. Yeah. And that, you know, once I realized that I wasn't going to grow anymore, um, I started taking some of the electives that we had in school a little more seriously. So we had a drafting class and I loved, for some reason, I fell in love with architecture at 17. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't understand why it was not, it wasn't like it was a cultural thing that was coming around, but you know, I was a kid that would change my room around a lot. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, this yeah. is the vibe right here. The bed on that wall, you know, just always that. And then I got into architecture real heavy and I love the aspect of designing stuff. And but that's engineering, man. Yeah. Like that's, that's all... <laughs> I'm not saying it's all 90 degrees, but it's, it's like really playing with corners, which is fun. Yeah. It's very fun. It's blo it's Legos. Yeah, exactly. It's Legos on the page. It's, I, yeah. I totally get it. I, I had a stint where I, I fell in love with that as well. But it just feels like, you know, when you're destined, you know, which I don't, I don't really want to use that word in reference to me, but just in general, like when you're destined to be a creative in some kind of way. It's like you're skipping around in these different mediums, uh, in art forms until you really find the one that just speaks to you in a way that's, uh, you know, uh, just you get lost in it. And, and 
the way I got lost in it when I started airbrushing and laying out graphics on bikes back in 2004, you know, I, I, you know, you get to this point like, Oh man, this is it. This is who I'm going to be. This is, this is the rest of my life. I'm going to try to be the best ever or the best I can ever be. And then 20 years into it, or, you know, for me, it was like 14 years into it. I fell in love with photography. Yeah, dude, it's a journey. And then you're like, you feel like you're cheating on this thing that this, this, this agreement you had with your younger self, no, if I you think will. You, I think you got to <laughs> let that go, man. You're, you're everything you learned yeah. in your process to get to airbrushing still applies to photography. Yeah. So you're ta- you're taking lighting, all, of that all that stuff. Yeah. 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 And you know, you're just even laying down a gradient or whatever, that hard line. Mm-hmm. And, and just like we were talking about pushing and pulling, like yeah. that all applies to photography. Yeah. And you know, like I said, so I'm, 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 as much as I'm just trying to like go with the wind, if you will, I'm also trying to uh, be conscious of all the different feelings, not feelings, but just the different, like how I feel during these processes and during these times and, you know, trying to also capture and know when that creativity is brewing to capture, to to, like use it. You know, it's not like a an endless supply in you. It's like you got to make some and then you get to use it while you have it. And then you got to, figure out how to make it again and then use it, you know, you, you'll just go on the ride, man. Yeah, it's, for sure. It, it gets a little more stressful as you get older and, and you feel yourself start to pivot where you go, man, I'm, I'm deep in tooling and, and the space that I've created. And now I'm trying to get into this other thing. And, and, um, that's the part that gets stressful. I think you should be excited to explore photography because it's only going to help all of those other things that you love. love so yeah, to do. photography, I'm, I'm pretty, it's, it's, it's part of my DNA now, but the, I'm, I, I'm like you, I, you know, you, you know, I got this paint now I'm forever a student of photography. Yeah, I don't feel like you ever quit learning in that as any other art form as well, but I got bit by the fabrication bug last year. Yeah. So I'm coming home to some packages that I can't wait to break <laughs> open. You get? Well, like to the point where, um, I, I ordered a welder, so yeah. a TIG welder, um, different uh, tools to basically be able to create my own exhaust system. Yeah. And Did you get a Miller or Lincoln? No, nah, I went Everlast, man. Whatever, man. They're they're getting good. Th- that's what everybody said. And, and yeah. I think for my, you know, whatever I'm going to do it, like whatever level it's going to be, that's going to be suffice enough. That way I'm not dropping six, seven grand that I don't actually have. No, man. Don't. On, don't you know, wait. Miller. And so what will happen, I guarantee, um, what will happen I mean, I'm very confident. I yeah. can't guarantee it, but you'll get in the circle, you know, the community of fabricators, uh, people, and someone will upgrade their tooling oh, there and you you'll get passed on a great opportunity to own something that isn't necessarily brand new, but you know, but works and do what I need it to do yeah. and do you do what you need it to do. Cause it's a community, you know, it's just like the parts we do in motorcycles mm. where you, you upgrade and yeah. things sitting around, taking up space and especially in a shop, you know, it gets yeah. very crowded very quick. So <laughs> you'll, if you're getting into it now, just be prepared. You're going to yeah. get a lot of shit coming your way. Yeah. yeah well, I've, I've, I am surrounded by a lot of amazing fabricators. So that's kind of one of those things that I was like, you know, I'm an idiot not to absorb all this knowledge True. that's around me. You yeah. know what I mean? So, and there was something that out of making the exhaust for a bike that I kind of more or less designed or built last year, um, by being a part of that, it, you know, making the exhaust, cutting the pipe, welding it together, it, like awoke something that was different, a different type of creativity. Uh, you know, this, this thing felt like, you know, it it just, it tapped into like a DNA thing, like a, like, you know, like some ancestry type shit, you know what I'm saying? You see some possibilities too. Yeah. Yeah. And and, And it's hard not to get excited because you realize, um, you know, it's a literally a blank page Mm. at that point. And, and that, that, that is the fundamental of, fabricating it's measuring and welding yep it's like after that you you could spend a lifetime just with those two skill sets building just keeping busy yeah building things yeah and modifying things exactly but the problem is then you get into motors (laughs) and then you start to see the possibilities of you know well we're gonna we're gonna put a little more gas in there you know we're gonna put a little more lift on that we're gonna and then your, your head does the same thing and then and then your shop is uh, bigger than your house. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm trying to be aware of that and not allow myself to uh, 
completely go down every uh, possible rabbit hole just so that I can still... What I love about my life, if, if we could talk about me for a second, sorry. I love it, uh, man. No. What I love about my life is that I have an escape from everything that I do in, in a way that's like... And not escape like I don't like it. It's just a, I can go do some helmets and refresh myself in another space. And then I get to go back to shooting photography or, or making podcasts or customizing motorcycles. Yeah. That's a and, great workshop. And then, you know, you're kind of like, you're, oh man, I want to get back and do this. And you do that, knock it out. And then you just, it, like I said, growing in, in, in an artistic way, you're just always trying to figure yourself out and how you do the, your best things and, and to make that machine more efficient and creative and pull the best ideas out of you and, you know, whatnot, but about you. <laughs> <laughs> no, what? I, uh, let me stop you there yeah. because you need, need, that's a great understanding of process. Yeah. Because if you are just, and I really respect the artists that can just do one thing. Yeah. But I don't, of this. I don't know many of them. I don't either. I mean, Michael Lichter is probably the best example of a, of a relentless photographer that I know because he, I can't keep up with him. How yeah. old is he now? Uh, whatever he is, I guarantee you, he doesn't look it. Dude. Or he, he does. Moves, I don't know. He moves so fast. He shoots all day. Then he goes back to his hotel or goes back home and he's on the computer and he has everything he shot organized and edited that night. And it's all, and it's some, in some cases it's up the next morning. Yeah. And yeah. Like, Did you sleep at all? Yeah. Did and you, have you been to his uh, studio in, in Boulder? No, I haven't yet. He's got a file, file cabinets for when they were all, you know, uh, f proofs and things like that or sure. uh, slides. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, He's it's, got his, an archive, I'm it's sure. as organized as, you know, his hard drives are. You would have to have a negative assets archive it, if you started when he did. Basically those two filing cabinets okay. over there are mine from when I started, but I didn't really have, you know, I still shoot. I still shoot a lot of film. Yeah, yeah. But I don't necessarily organize it the way that I did. Mm. And you know, in school that was something that they that was part of the the uh, curriculum was organizing negative assets mm -hmm. because everything was on, you know, it, it was it was analog. Yeah, and yeah. And there was a there was a whole it's like the Dewey Decimal System of, and, yeah. which is really handy to know. And the more I think about it, I'm like, my God, if there were some mechanical or, um, you know, a grid disaster now and these hard drives couldn't spin anymore, yeah. like I wouldn't, I wouldn't have anything recent. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is something to say about having those, uh, analog archives in place. Yeah. Or, or, I mean, just simply trying to find a reason or a place to print, yeah. you know, to get stuff out of the digital world and bring it to the physical world. You yeah. know, I had a, when I was, when I had the chun, I had a good little dark room set up in the, well, I didn't have a dark room. I had, I had a, a little bay that I could develop my own film and scan my own film. Yeah. Um, I couldn't do any, any, I tried doing enlarging in there, but uh, it's just such a dust. It's so dusty. Yeah. Know? Our shop was so filthy and, uh, you couldn't really do any enlarging, but I had at that time, I had a really big Epson printer. Um, so I could s develop all my own film, then scan it and then print yeah. off the printer, which for my purposes was much better. Yeah. So when you've, got out of college like was the first opportunity going to Seattle or did you kind of bounce around it almost it pretty much was it was yeah. it was a crazy opportunity that popped up I think I did I did two jobs before that I did a, a small film project uh, a short film we shot in like 40 locations across Kansas and we mm. shot Panavision okay. you know like big 35 millimeter cameras yeah. and I was like this is it I'm going into movies and then it, that voice of reality started sinking in again. And it's like, you've got to, you've got to pursue something more realistic. And, um, then I got on the, uh, I got on the army strong campaign and this was 2005 yeah. where we shot the campaign for the U S army. And that was a crazy project, man. We had tanks and helicopters and we're blowing shit up. It was a $1 billion shoot. 
Damn. They spent a billion dollars on that shoot. Like photography shoot? There's photography and, and uh, film. And and yeah, motion. It was all their commercial spots okay. for for the US Army. Um and I and I again I was I was like, man, should I should I move out to LA? Should I pursue this? Because a lot of the crews were coming out from LA. And I was this close to doing that, but I got a call from or I I saw an opening happen at K2. And I put my resume in and I got a call back and I ended up, you know, they surprisingly, it only took like a month and they offered me a job to come mm-hmm. out. And, uh, it, it was just consistent work, you mm-hmm. know, and I had nothing coming out of school. I had debt and yeah, you know, yeah. it was like, I got, I just have to do, do this. And so I did, I ended up staying way longer than I thought, but I learned a lot and that's when, motorcycles really became a huge part of my life when I was living in Seattle and, um, I met a community Yeah, and we had, we built a community shop space Mm -hmm. and I still think about that place almost every day. It was just such a church for all these kind of misfits. Yeah. It it was beautiful. And it was realistically, it was the reason I, I stayed so long, but I, I met a lot of great machinists and friends and, um, that's when I kind of aimed my camera more towards motorcycles Mm -hmm. than commercial work. Yeah. How did you find that though? Like, I mean, is it just like the local kind of bike nights? Bike nights. It was like this, this thing that would get, these people would gather together. And I, I ended up meeting just a couple friends, my, my friend tower and analog and Nick DiPaolo Mm -hmm. were like the first three friends that I made. And we stuck together in Seattle for years after that. And, uh, there was a local shop, uh, called twin line that had a space in Georgetown at that time. And they were in the process of moving. So we helped them move the shop to a bigger space in Beacon Hill. And we all became friends and all ended up in the same shop space. Okay. And then the, my roommate tower ended up taking over the lease. And that's when I ended up putting my photo studio and we lived together and we worked together and I put my photo studio in the shop. Mm -hmm. I built a a big psych wall where I could shoot bikes on and and still build. It was like all mobile. And we had years of fun, man. Nice. Years of fun in that space. And that building's not even there anymore. So it kind of breaks my heart, but. Um, so that's this, where the two really came together. Yeah. And at this time as well, you know, this is kind of like heyday of the blogs. It was. And all that stuff going on. Yeah. Right? It was about, it was about 2009, I think when we all moved into the same space. What else can I say about the Thunder Max products and the team behind them? I have run the Thunder Max tuners on my fuel injected Harleys for years before I met the men behind the brand. Now for the last five years, Thunder Max has not only supported our podcast, but have been a big supporter of everything from small events to the biggest rallies across America. For those of you who are not familiar with the Thunder Max tuners, they replaced your fuel-injected Harley ECM and O2 sensors with their proprietary ECM module and wideband O2 sensors. This allows your computer to auto-tune itself based on the readings from those wideband O2 sensors. Adding a new exhaust, cam, or big board kit has never been easier with the Thunder Max units eliminating the need for dyno tuning and its reoccurring costs. To learn more about their products, visit thunder-max.com. If you decide to make a purchase, remember to use the Fast Life offer code at checkout to save 10% on your order. Finally, don't forget to follow the team on Instagram at thundermaxefi. What was it like just being able to, you know, obviously have your your group, your your family there, in a sense, your motorcycle family, finding out all these other people that had similar things going on. Cause it seemed like a very similar from what like Kirpius and then we're doing in like the Milwaukee. It was. Yeah. It, it was like, how did like simultaneously this whole thing start to happen in different parts of the country? Almost like it was a, like it was a, it was connected in some kind of weird way. It was. And I, I think there were a lot of creatives that were, um, you know, Josh was a, he was uh, a jewelry designer yeah. and um, there's a, there's a, a real 
specific aesthetic when you're doing anything on that scale, that small, you know, the attention to details and insane. Mm-hmm. And I, I think there was a lot of creatives that were looking for something more exciting mm-hmm. and you don't even have to be a creative or someone who's into motorcycles to look at a bike and be excited by it. Yeah. It's, it's just a, uh, uh, such a distilled representation of energy, you mm-hmm. know, a motor between two wheels. It's yeah. like you, you, that will always catch anybody's eye. It's almost like nudity, you know, it's mm-hmm. not in photography. I don't, I don't do a lot of nudes or shoot that way in my, in my opinion. Um, and I think that's great when photographers, kind of find a niche for that. But like, I kind of want to explore people more for, you know, uh, their story less Mm -hmm. than their body shape, you know, what that, that may look like. And, um, I kind of wanted to do, to do the same thing with the motorcycle. Mm. And, and I think there were other people who were looking at bikes at that time with more, than just a, an interest in riding them. It was more of a, a community to to build and what it represented was very exciting. But as we said before, there was, it was everything else. Mm-hmm. It was a place to go. It was almost like your bar that you were talking yeah. about seeking out that that place. And if I'm honest about it, I think it was just the perfect equation to build itself. Mm. You had, a, you had, enough, uh, I guess technically I'm Gen X coming out. The last year of it, I think. Yeah, I think so. You had enough of us, um, not wanting to go into traditional, um, workspaces Mm -hmm. and looking to seek out their own interests. And, and I think the timing of all of that was just perfect. And it built these little communities all over the country and then through the blogs at that time, it connected yeah. each other and inspired each other. We fed off of each other. And then through social media, we ended up meeting each other. Yeah. It was like this perfect pyramid scheme that built our little industry. Because yeah, would you say that, you know, social media in 2009 was Facebook, but yeah, but much different looking thing than it is today. Yeah. So, and growing, you know, like I said, I got into motorcycles, my area of this industry or culture, if you will. And in 2004, when MySpace was the biggest thing. I remember that. Yeah. There wasn't, at least in my eyes and my experience, I didn't feel like a, there was a motorcycle culture on MySpace. There wasn't. It was really the blogs that created that. And then the social media came next where the blogs kind of transitioned into more of the Instagram. Yeah. And, um, you know, there were, I, I took a lot of my cues from looking at what, who my friends are now, yeah. um, what they were doing, uh, mostly in California, there were yeah. a few East coast guys that I followed, but living in Seattle, we were a shop culture because yeah. we had nine months out of the year where we, we couldn't ride comfortably. Mm-hmm. We'd still do it, but it was just miserable. Yeah, so yeah. we were a shop culture. We built things and we lived in the shop. And I would frequently look at what life was like in the sun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Through these through these other blogs, and uh, you know, it, it kind of set my sights on California. That was probably the reason why I wanted to move to California so bad. And, um, by the time I connected with a lot of the guys out here, like Michael Schmidt is a good example of that. The world is flat was his blog. And I just loved being in my little dark studio, looking at, you know, all this cool shit that he was shooting out in California. It looked like a fucking fantasy. Nice. And he did such a good job of documenting it at that time with the small group that was coming up. And then Troy moved out to California from Seattle. So Troy was up there originally. Yeah. Troy was in oh, Seattle. Okay. He was, he was in our crew nice. and, um, he, he, I watched him build his first panhead, and that is really what I shaped my shovel head off of. We yeah. both, we both bought our first big twins off the same guy and, um, watching him go through that arc. And then he went out to California and left, and uh, basically didn't come back. And then um, 
I took a trip out to visit him mm -hmm. and, and, uh, was really excited. He picked me up at the airport and he was like, oh man, we got to go down to little Tokyo. They show, they sell chopper magazines. I was like, all right, let's go. And so he's driving me around LA, showing me this, showing me that. And we get to little Tokyo. This is one of the greatest days of my life, man. I, <laughs> I, I, it, it kind of, it just solidified everything for me. It was like, yeah. I had no doubt in my head where I wanted to be. Mm. So we, we go to the uh, bookstore there and we're looking through the magazines and there's these great chopper magazines. I'm looking at the photography and I'm like, that's it, man. That's what I want to shoot. Yeah. And then he opens up one of them and he's like, dude, that's you. And it was this article about born free. One of the early born frees. And I yeah. would have never found this otherwise if, yeah, if he wouldn't have yeah. taken me there. And it was like this picture of me uh, in the field sitting on my bike. It's this girl beside me and she's on her bike. It was this great shot. And I was like, holy shit, man. I would have, I, you know, it, it was so special to see that in print. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I, I got to move out here. And then <laughs> later on, and then after, from there, this is so funny because we were in downtown. From there, he took me to Dugan's shop, mm -hmm. which was where I eventually ended up living. Okay. And I hadn't met Sean and we went and, and Snake hadn't gotten the space below. So it was just Sean's house and, and shop up above the, in the building. And we went up there. He wasn't home. And he's like, I know where he's at. He's at Jackman's, um, tattoo stu studio. So yeah. we go to, to Craig Jackman's and then on, on the same day I met Sean Dugan, Craig Jackman. And, um, who else was there? Oh, Bill Buckingham. Uh -huh. I met those three legends on the same day in, uh, through Troy. And then Troy got a tattoo that day. And we just sat in that tattoo parlor on sunset, just like mm. fucking rapping the whole time. And they were on their J, they were all on JDs. Mm. Those three guys were on these old ass JDs. It was like so fucking cool. And, uh, yeah, that, that trip was just experience after experience. I met snake on that trip mm -hmm. and then that's what solidified it for me. I was like, all right, I'm moving down. And eventually Snake got the space below. And then we ended up living down there for eight years. Was it Chopper, like the D Chopper's magazine that's currently out? Or no, was it like some other? it was the Japanese magazine. That, see, that's the thing. Those Japanese magazines are old hot bikes and old, oh man. Exactly. And I didn't know it. Like I wasn't aware that they were so, that that culture was so developed over there. Yeah. I thought it was, you know, it's just here in California. Yeah, yeah. But even to this day, they do it better than we do. Yeah. Just the, 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 just the way that they're like raised, the, their demeanor, you know, the way that they respect things and stuff, you know, but. They're so grateful for, um, they see such value mm -hmm. in detail and in age and, and function. They're, they're just, they're, what a first class. It's culture. like they don't, they don't. They, they don't lose anything, any skills, any ideas. They just grow with the emphasis of still paying homage to that before it. Right. They, they do. Yeah. And to the point where it's, it's recognized institutionally, like okay. you can get a loan from a bank and this is what I've heard. I could be wrong, but you can get a loan from the bank to go buy a knucklehead. Mm. Like they will finance that because they see the value mm. in, in these things and the culture that's been built off of that. That's Try crazy. doing that here. Yeah. Come they'll on. laugh at you. <laughs> they'll laugh at you. And, and, and that's a realization that I'm having now too. Um, just more recently, it's like, we, you and I see the value in this. Mm -hmm. Our little community sees the value in this, but I don't have kids. Mm. And if I don't pass that on, to someone, and let's say I, I I go down tomorrow and die and get hit by a car, and you you guys aren't around. Mm -hmm. This is a bunch of junk. Yeah, it's a bunch of fucking junk that barely runs to most people. There's yeah. no value in it. So it's a real, in a lot of ways, it's a real risk because um, it's not. And it's coming around now that it's getting into the mainstream. I think most people, they know what a panhead is, yeah. which is really shocking. They know what a knucklehead is. These are common uh, words in the vernacular, mm -hmm. but they're not, um, they're still not recognized 
for their value, mm-hmm. at least to what we so hold them like to. Like the value for you as an individual, not your, the value as a, oh, I could sell this for 25 grand. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Well, that, that completely makes sense. And, uh, you know, on the Troy subject that, that, uh, getting those, those recordings from Rocco, that was, we listened to that on this trip. Now that was awesome. Oh man. You know, yeah. cause that was special. It was man. And then, you know, the, the other crazy thing is the first podcast we did on this trip is a friend out of, uh, um, Albuquerque that was kind of around the scene in LA. Um, but more so, uh, he was on FXR and he worked kind of in the movie set stuff, right? Mm. Building. And he played in a band with, I believe his name is Ethan. That was in oh, your book. Oh, Ethan Fowler. Yeah. So they were in a band together for a long time. Oh, get the fuck out. And so when I told him like, oh man, you know, I'm like nerding out, dude, I'm going to get to talk to Todd on this. And I showed him the book and the morning we stayed at his house, he was making breakfast for us and I, he was like flipping through it and he was like blown away because of his connection to Ethan and seeing all the photos that you had taken of him and you know, the night before we had talked about, cause I've read the book and I've seen it all. And I was like, yeah. So he, he stayed in, he was telling me what took place, but was also documented in the book. Yeah. Cause his connection to him as, as oh, friends and so whatnot. Cool. Cause you know, Ethan, like he, 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 kind of, I met him on that trip. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know. So Ethan he knew the lady that the house that yeah, y'all were all that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they, they had such a history together. She's a photographer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. a, she's a very uh, successful, um, great photographer and, you know, globally, like she yeah. shoots everything. So, you know, obviously, you know, to kind of lay a little bit of foundation before we start talking about your book and, you know, I want to say this first, like for me finding that as a guy that's been in motorcycles for, you know, 20 years this year, I found something new that's old to you, oh, well, but it's great. brand new to me. And it, and exposed it, it, you know, the same way, you know, I guess it's all perspective, right? Some people might log on to Instagram right now. They just got a, a new soft tail M8 and this, that that's the new for them is that this culture they find. Yeah. So for me, this was new and it, it spoke to me in a way and especially how I got it, man, I'm sitting in Michael Lichter's backyard, a, a photographer that I admire and I'm finally becoming friends with this man. And he's, he's, he opened up his home to me and then he walks out and he lays out all these photo books on the table. He says, man, check these all out because I was telling him how I just felt like photography. I don't know where to put it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to put it on social media. I don't, I, I, I don't feel like, I want it to mean something more to take a picture and put it somewhere. So we started printing for our house. Yeah. Print. We started yeah. doing these other things. And then he showed me the books and I was like, you're on the right track. I was like, Holy this. shit, man. And I, I literally, I think I tagged you in it cause I was flipping through it and I already knew you from the, listening to the, the podcast and I already was following and everything like that, but I didn't know about the book. That's so funny. I, I literally ordered it right there. Uh, so I'm on my way to Sturgis. So I get home from Sturgis. I'm like, read the whole thing the first day, which it's, it's, you can, you can bang it out in a day. Oh yeah. It, it's, it's vignettes. Yeah. I yeah. wanted to make it very digestible. Mm-hmm. Like the first draft, we cut 119 pages. Oh shit. And we reduced it down to just vignettes because when you're doing a book, it's really hard. You know, when you do a film, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't have to be 90 minutes. You know, if you make a feature film, it can be, you know, Christopher Nolan length or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a story, but when you're adding pages, it gets very expensive. So there's yeah. like a, there's like a page count and the, the publisher that I, that I published through, they really wanted to include, they wanted to make it more photo based because they were scared that more people would not buy it if it had more words. Mm. So we had to figure out how to tell the story in those vignettes. Okay. Which so, was a good choice. You know, um, what this trip, this, you know, it very well documented and, and not to kind of spoil the book for people, but how you talked about it in the, in, in just the, uh, the words at the beginning of the book about like this trip, like, about the trip and not the book, what was it? It was it just like trying to find the new, a new path. Like you, you reached a roadblock in 
where you were at? I mean, you were just telling me about how California was it, but was doing the entire country about maybe seeing the entire country first before picking a, another place to reside for a while? Yeah, it, it had a lot to do with that. Okay. And, you know, it wasn't even seven days before that, that I had just buried both my parents. Yeah, yeah. So I was in a space where um, I... I knew if I, I was very aware of a ticking clock, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's like I watched my mom and dad prepare for this chapter of their life, their entire life. Mm-hmm. And then it was over in a split second. Gone, yeah. And I've started thinking about that in terms of my own life. And I, it felt like, it was now or never. I would probably spend the next ten, another 10 years in Seattle doing my job mm-hmm. if I didn't kind of just go. Mm-hmm. And this was probably the only excuse in life I would ever give myself, as sad as it was, to cut all ties and just basically shut the phone off and go. Yeah. And, and that's what it took for me to do Yeah. That. Man, it was, yeah, I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to bring it up, but man, that, that was, that set the tone and it also, you know, the wording and how you, you writ, you wrote through it and the, the underlying self work that you were doing almost in the entire book made it so much more, it made the pictures mean something, you know, well, that's it, man. And if you're going to, if you're going to pursue photography in a fulfilling way, mm-hmm be a storyteller, be a storytelling photography. There's so many great photographers that can take an interesting image, but it has no, it has no story behind it. You know, it'll, it'll grab your attention for a second, but you'll never go back to it again. So I I wanted that. I felt a sense of urgency to tell that time for what it was so that, you know, the memory of that wouldn't necessarily get blurry. I just wanted to keep it sharp. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't know if it was going to be a book. I didn't know what it was going to be. I just knew that there was a story here to tell. And talking about Ethan, watching his life develop on the road with me was better than my own. And so, you know, him and Ariel are still my nearest and dearest, you know, the connection that we have and watching them, they're married now. They got the heads, you know, and it's like that, um, that journey that he went on by itself would be worth telling. Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. And I, I love that there's almost like four different storylines taking place within this book that, um, you know, whether it's through the photography or through the words and the letters that are kind of uh, portrayed in it, it, it just, it, it spoke to me in a lot of ways, you know what I'm saying? And on top of that, like I, you know, as th- on the photographer side of, it, I knew you wanted to get out and shoot and, you know, it was about chasing being creative through photography, but would you say that there were areas of, you know, cause telling a story is almost like being a well-rounded photographer in every different aspect, Yeah, you know, from landscape to, you know, architecture to portraiture to, you know, use you, you know, it all kind of comes together to, to, you know, pass the time if you will. So did you feel like you were like proficient in any of that to do it? Or was this more of a, 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 a journey to learn? I saw it. I saw a lot of things unfolding at Mm. once, but I didn't really, in the moment, you can't really know what that is. So I shot in a way that um, it it had the potential of developing into a story because I just never knew where we'd be the next day, what the next thing would unfold. So there was never an arc I was making in this whole thing, but I was shooting it in a way that if, if this were the story to tell, I wanted to have the assets to do that. Mm. And it didn't take too long for me to, as I was getting to know Ethan and understanding, you know, his, he had so many chapters of his life at that point, being a professional skater and, and then, you know, being a musician and, and touring in a band. And he had all these circles of friends as we were going across the country. I was like, you know, Ethan is a half the story already, Yeah. but it, he's, he's lived so many different lives that I just kind of like, I watched it unfold and mm-hmm. I got to know my friend Yeah. 
and we were just there together. I happened to have a camera. And then when we got back to my hometown, Lawrence, where I went yeah. to school, I, I was born, I, I, I grew up in another town, but where I went to school, he met this woman on his own. I wasn't even there. Yeah. I was at my, my nephew's peewee football game. <laughs> and by the time I caught back up with him and, uh, you know, we didn't know, we, we had planned to leave the next day. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and we're just headed East at this point. We have this idea of getting to, you know, the other side of the country. Yeah. And, and there was, there was a little, there was somewhat of a, of a, I don't, I don't want to call it. How would I put it? I had some motivation to get there because I had broken up with my girlfriend who was living with me just before all the other shit went down. Mm -hmm. I had, she, she had, she had left. I was on a, an assignment in China and she had moved out, you know, and there was a lot of unfinished finished business. Yeah. And she had moved herself to New York and, and I was just lonely and yeah. I wanted to see her. Yeah. So I had to get there. You know, I was like, I'm just aiming for this person who's familiar to me. I yeah. don't know what's going to happen. And I was caught up in that a lot of the way. I don't write about this that much because I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to make it about that. Yeah. Uh, but by the time I had gotten there, I'd let go a lot, let go a lot of that. Mm, I think you wrote about it some in the I book. Did. Though, right? I did. Yeah. I, I did reference it a little bit, but by the time I had gotten back round trip back to Seattle and was sitting down with everything, the story had changed story yeah. was, wasn't about that anymore. And, and that had run its course and it, and we had talked and it was, you know, what yeah, it was yeah. and that was fine. So there was no reason to, you know, bring that. Yeah. Too deep into it. Yeah. And, and put it in writing, mm. you know, it was like everything else deserved to be in writing in that memory. So that's where, yeah, it, to, I guess that's a very, long-winded way to answer your question. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew it was going to be the confluence of a lot of stories and a hallmark of my life mm. and a lot of people's lives Yeah, that we were reaching on these fucking old bikes, these cameras and, um, and the shape didn't take place until after I got home. So when you left, you wanted to make something, but did you know that was a book? Yeah, I had, I had, um, there was a company out of Seattle called Bell and Whistle, mm -hmm. who was a design firm. And through the bike connection, I had become good friends with the owner and he had followed my blog and liked my writing and liked my photography mm -hmm. and said, I, I want to do a print book with you. Mm -hmm. And I go, man, that's great. I have no idea how I would have time to do that, but in my mind bringing all this home was fulfilling what he wanted to do as well. Mm. And so that's what it all turned okay. into. And, um, and yeah, and Gabe, Gabe was like the first person who backed me, who okay. like believed in me and, and saw it through. And then, and then Ginkgo press uh, who published the book was the, the next one. And I really, I really appreciate both those. Uh, and the, the crazy thing is listening to your podcast, um, the one that you've done, you know, which I envy because of the, the way that you're able to do it is a way that I wish I could, but mine's more of my business, mm, you know? How so? I, Cause I make a, you know, I, I pay almost my entire living doing podcasts. Yeah. So. I can tell by the, you're very yeah. professional. Like this, this setup is really, I can see how much work you've put in. Yeah. This. So in, in doing so, um, I, you know, and this is, this is an excuse more than it is a restraint, but I, I listen to yours and I'm just like, man, this is the vibe I want. This is it. But it's, it's not my vibe. It's your vibe. Right. And it's, it's making me want to understand this better and do a better job at telling people stories and stuff. But 
I have quotas I got to hit every month. Dude, if you have made a living doing this, you are doing a great job. I don't know <laughs> if I would change a thing because it is a lot of work. And if yeah. you're, I still have to paint. Don't get me wrong. I still yeah. have to paint. Um, but you know, there's the, you but know, dude, you're, you're, the, you're living the dream, man. You're, you're making your own way off both the, yeah. the, um, interest in art that you have. That's yeah. a very hard thing to do. I'm not, I'm not complaining about that. I'm yeah. not at all. Um, it's I'm just a, saying like, yeah. don't overthink it. Yeah, like I, yeah. I think your stuff is great and uh, you've worked very hard to do it. So consider yourself a, a success <laughs> on that level. Um, well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I, I just, I dig the the vibe and the flow, but that's also, it's, it's a skill that you have in storytelling that I haven't developed yet that I feel like, you know, it's not, like, Oh man, I got to get this, this vibe like you, but no, it's, it's, it's your skills and your, the way you see the world and that's how you present it. And I need to go live my life and figure out how I see the world that way. Yeah. In that way. To, I would recommend that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing that's kind of, I guess, an older thing that I've taken from being inspired by people is to not blatantly be like, you did that. I'm doing this, you know, but to, put myself in a space similar to the stories that you've told on your stuff to find my own version of what that is. Yeah, man. And, so, and the worlds that you're a part of hold that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just converting, making the equation. And I love painting. I have so much respect for painters. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm so, I'm just not, I just don't have, first of all, it, it's such a patient pursuit. Mm -hmm. People don't understand how long it takes to just do a tank Yeah, and the days and the levels and also the comprehension of, of process. Yeah. Yeah. What comes before what? Yeah. And if something goes wrong, how many steps backward do I go on this? To me, I equate it to editing video. Um, that takes a long time and the more time you take and the more you really feel it out, the better and the more it becomes something that you're proud of. Right. Yeah. Um, pain is a very space space, not wasting, but consuming thing. Oh my God. Yeah. And it's also a very expensive thing that, you know, you need to buy these things to make these things. Yeah. You know, it, yeah, you could say that I, I could take a picture, but I, you know, if I'm not doing film, I, I have everything I need to go capture fit pictures all year. Yeah. You know, but, um, or, you know, yeah, obviously there's metal and fabrication things like that, but you know, it, it's a thing, right. But it's a time consuming thing that makes it hard to put the time into the other passions that you have when you have 40 hours in a motorcycle helmet. Dude, I get it. You yeah. know, so you're, I'm using whatever form of youth that I have to try and basically work two full-time jobs to see if there's a real opportunity to be a full-time, you know, podcast or photographer, which, you know, any of that stuff, right. Not quite say like confident enough to say, all right, paint is about to be even a smaller part of my life. You know, I'm never going to quit it. That's yeah. one thing I'll never quit, but as far as having to do it to pay the bills would be nice to be able to start painting for, uh, the passion of doing the art and not the fact that I need that money this month. So to do it. most projects that you take on are customer base yeah. or, or, okay. So would you rather be in a position where you could stylize and paint your own vision onto a tank and sell that and make yeah. your living doing that? If you're looking for high quality motorcycle lighting, then check out Custom Dynamics. It doesn't matter if your motorcycle has been around the block or it's fresh off the showroom floor. They offer a wide range of LED lighting options for various models, as well as custom applications. They have been in business for over 25 years and are committed to providing top notch products at competitive prices. On my FXR Chopper, I'm running one of their custom application LED tail light strips and their industry standard 5.75 LED headlight. And on my Lowrider ST, I have been running their Pro Beam Series LED turn signals, tail light, and headlight. You can check out their website at customdynamics.com to explore the available LED lighting options for your motorcycle. And don't forget to follow them on Instagram at Custom Dynamics. That's, that's kind of the thing that's that there's an opportunity there, especially, you know, not so much tanks for me, but helmets and some of those type of things yeah. I could. Um, and that's definitely something every once in a while when I get time, I do, 
Uh, but you know, that's, that's still kind of a scary thing for me. Like, ah, oh, well, if I just stop taking commissions yeah, yeah is, yeah. you know, I can sell a flame helmet all day long. Those, those never go out of style. But yeah. if I start diving into like creative art or like directions that I might not be that versed in, or might not be that popular currently, that's where you get that. I feel like you, by doing stuff on your own, you have to do it without the intention to sell it in your head. Yes, I know. In order yeah. to get past it and then say, oh yeah, by the way, I was going to sell this. It's well, like you got to lie to yourself. That's the fine art side of it. Yeah. When you start doing something for for fine art work more than commission. I, I painted, I did, I dabbled in the fine art community in Dallas, like doing like canvases and never really a graffiti artist, but you know, graffiti art really was one of those art forms that kind of a lot of the people in it started to transfer into different types of styles on canvases. So I was doing a lot of art shows in like 09, 08 mm -hmm. and still painting motorcycles as the main gig. But it was around there where the decision to not pursue fine art anymore and strictly focus on mo motorcycles as like, like I paint motorcycles all day, but then I come home and I paint canvases. Yeah. So then I was like, you know, that's hard. I, that's so really I, hard. I traded the canvases for the motorcycles. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. I can understand that. But bikes would be really hard, and I'm not familiar with the Dynas and yeah, the yeah. FXRs. And, but there, there's a lot of components to those. Yeah, yeah. So you can't just sell a tank. Like, yeah. there's all the other fairings that have to be yeah. considered in, in that. And also the arrangement of where they set on the bike, I'm sure varies from different riders yep. how they like to put those on. So it would be really hard to sell a body to someone that yeah. hasn't, that isn't more of that commission type situation. So that, that's where the helmets came in. And that's why we paint probably 90% of the paint we do is helmets. And we do a handful of bikes every year. Right? That makes sense. Yeah. I, and, and when I say we, I have friends that help that kind of come around the shop, but it's, I'm a one man operation yeah. through and through. Um, and in doing that, I'm able to, uh, you know, I have a great relationship with Simpson motorcycle helmets and that's kind of where I only offer those helmets. I don't, it's not of any kind of, uh, um, you know, how did that get started with you or, or, um, you have the brand relationship to Simpson, to Simpson and, and whoever else that you, you include on your show. Yeah. So obviously being in like my first uh, job in the motorcycle industry was wet sanding gas tanks for a shop that painted for, you know, the in the early 2000s, your TV era chopper, biker oh, build off yeah, stuff. Yeah. So we're painting for Rick Fairless that owns Strokers Dallas. Big wide tire choppers. Yeah. yeah. And so my- That's a lot of paint. Those bikes were huge. They were huge. <laughs> and they were all airbrushed and they were, they were wild. So, yeah. you know, my second, third week, in this job that I, I knew I, I grew up in a body shop, like sanding and painting and motorcycles weren't my thing, but this job was my job. And then being around it and seeing how cool the, my boss was and this cool bikes and much more of a materialistic, um, uh, you know, I'm 21 at the time. So I'm way more like this dude's got a prowler. Mm. This dude's got a, uh, an avalanche on 24. Remember I grew, I grew up in the hood, man. Like, yeah these things, these values that I had, uh, just in, instilled in me were, I knew that you were, you had yeah. that urban eye when you yeah. were talking about sneaker culture, yep. because that was where that developed and was. Yep. And so doing that, you know, or basically two weeks into this, there's a film crew there filming for biker build off. Right. And I'm like, Oh shit. Like, so I go home and I start watching biker build off and motorcycle mania. And then I start watching, um, what do you call it? Uh, the, 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 what's the monster garage? Oh yeah. And yeah, so yeah. those, those programs to me, God, some of those are still running. I think monster garage, they, still. they've had some iterations come back around. Okay. Yeah. So what that did for me was guy that grew up in a body shop that never wanted to go. Mind you, I'm the guy with the nice shoes that don't want to get them dirty. <laughs> and my dad's dragging me to do child labor, wet sanding cars. Right. Yeah, yeah. There was nothing cool about that shop space that I was working in. So those shows showed me that there's a cool artistic nature to these bikes mm. that you can be creative and you can be um, innovative and you can, you can start somewhere and grow and evolve. And that's not something I felt like 
you know, I had in that space. And at the time I was in that, you know, I had a, you know, I'm telling you my story. <laughs> uh, I want to know it, man. Uh, sitting down in, this is my podcast. Just man. before that, uh, <laughs> just before I took the job working on the, you, you know, the, uh, the motorcycles, I was in high school still my last year and I was really proficient at drafting uh, cause I was going to go to college for architecture it's doing really well. We had vocational programs and, and, and competitions amongst Texas that I was, I did really well in had a job. I was pretty much doing a draftsman's job as an intern with like minimum wage pay, which back then was like five fifty an hour, right. maybe six. <laughs> and I'm running blueprints. I'm smelling like the uh, iodine or whatever that solution was. And, and the guys around me that the first step of the architecture was that bachelor's degree. And I had two guys that had that, that I worked with. And then there was an architect in there. Well, those dudes looked miserable and I saw it every day. And what that job showed me is that I love to create, but I don't want to draw it and give it to somebody else to create it. Yeah. Yeah. So I learned that I wanted to, have an idea and I wanted to be in the place to execute the idea and be the one that creates it to own that. Right. And whether people think this is funny or not, um, fast and the furious came out. Mm -hmm. And once again, my childhood forced job was working in a body shop. Well, that movie came out and that made cars cool to me mm -hmm. because I couldn't afford a hot rod. Like, you know, I couldn't afford, you know, any kind of more, you know, American muscle kind of thing. And I didn't grow up in a family where we just had those laying around the house, you know? So I'm like, well, shit, I can get a freaking Nissan. <laughs> you know what I mean? And actually my girlfriend had one, she wrecked it a while back. So I got that car and built it. I, all this stuff that I was forced to do as a kid was still in there. Yeah. And so I, I, you're doing it for yourself. Now. Yeah. Now, I, now I'm hungry. I want it. And so I got into the car culture, the, the import scene real heavy and racked up a lot of tickets <laughs> trying to street race, but I really wanted to be a mechanic. I didn't want to be a painter, mm -hmm. but I used my painter, uh, you know, knowledge and, you know, position to walk into circles and kind of find my way to the middle of every scene that I've ever been a part of. Yeah. That makes sense. You know? Yeah. So lo and behold, next thing you know, I'm, you know, I'm done with the cars. I'm, I'm, I actually still have it at this time when I get this uh, job working on bikes or painting bikes or sanding them, I wasn't painting them. And then it wasn't two months, it w wasn't a month in it. I sold the car to buy my first bike and all I had was a bike. See, it got you in that circle too. Yeah. And so now I'm in the middle of that. And, um, you know, there, there, there's a cultural side to that, that I, that I have, you know, I try to tell those stories through this podcast as well, that while it's a very different world than this vintage world, I think that it, not to talk down upon it, but it, it has much more of a financial materialistic twist to it, you know, that I'm not mad at that, but I think that as I've, you know, if we go, we, we fast forward 20 years, I'm looking for more real, yeah. more to be surrounded by more people that are not that they're not real. I, I don't want to talk shit about it. I, I want I'm just trying to purvey this, this feeling that I have and well, I don't know the, the words same, yet. It's the same reason you like things in print. Yeah. Right. You like you, you are, you have some great digital cameras in here, but it's very special to shoot a film a photograph on film and then process it and, and enlarge it. Yeah. And that is because it's an analog process. It's taking you backwards to more the essence of, of what this thing is. Mm -hmm. It's stripping everything away that has been made convenient. Mm -hmm. And now you're, you're left with the kind of messy mechanical, hands-on, demanding side of this machine that you're riding every day. And from that, a new relationship develops with it. Mm. It's no longer just get on and go yeah, and twist that throttle. It's, I got to listen. I got to maintenance. And I, I now have this relationship with this bike that if I hear anything or feel any, like that front end that I'm fucking with in yeah. my garage, 
by all matter, like I could put anybody on that bike and they'd ride it and be like, this thing's perfect. And yeah. I know that it's not, Yeah, you know, so I'm going to have to go dig in deep and figure out what that tiny little click is. Yeah. Um, and that's the direction I personally think everybody will go in whether mm. they want to or not, whether you start there or not. I think that is at its core, what people aspire to be on a motorcycle is, is the person so connected to that machine that they can hear, sense, feel anything going on with it. Yeah. And bikes back in this era were built for that. Yeah. They came, I mean, there's a parts manual that <laughs> will tell you every part of a big twin. 41 from, to 83. That's right. <laughs> and, and you learn the bike in terms of, of that manual mm. that came with a manual for the owner to use. Yeah. And, um, I don't blame you for saying that. And I don't, I don't want to take away from anybody doing modern bikes. And I think they're incredibly fucking impressive. And I get on one and I go, I should never be on this. I will kill my fucking self. <laughs> Meanwhile, these guys are doing wheelies and jumping them and, yeah. you know, just, just un, uncontested amounts of horsepower yeah, and uh, throttle response. And, and that's really impressive. Mm. But there is something lacking when you don't quite have the connection that we're talking about with your machine. And there's only one way that you get that. It's when you basically build it yeah. from the crank pin up. <laughs> and, um, and I learned something new every time I go out in yeah. my garage and it is so satisfying. It's so frustrating, but it's so satisfying. And I would encourage anybody who wants to get into that to pursue it because you will live a very fulfilled, ex you will have a very fulfilled experience if you yeah. do listen to that voice. You know, the, there, there's a lot of like, there's a multitude of factors on my end that's, that I feel like it's, it's really, you know, the spotlight is on this, this culture and I'm trying to do my best not to exploit it in any kind of way. That's uh that's great, man. I, that's I not, appreciate um, your intuition with that. You know, it's, I really do. One of the, one of the themes of, of this trip is, and the conversations I've been having when, when this topic comes up is I'm trying to, I'm trying to be a student into it, not come in here and preach or this or that, because I don't know it, but you will be met with welcome arms yeah. if that's the case, because people really who give a lot to it, they know the difference when someone is taking mm. or actually genuinely wants to learn. Yeah. And we need them be to, for this thing to continue on the right path and, and remain in the right hands with the right community. And I'll tell you, we talked about it in the driveway a little bit where the community is changing hands a little bit. And you, I'm, kind of I'm, you talk about this on your podcast. And it was one of the questions I wanted to ask you, yeah. is, you know, the, the, for lack of a better term and maybe a, a generalization, the, the good old days of, you know, maybe, you know, the Chun or yeah. this time in LA, like what, what is that? What is it? What did it look like? And do you think it's like recreatable? Well, what's happening? Is there a soul there that can be reignited? Th there, there's still a, there's still soul left mm -hmm. in these pockets, but for for a lot of a, uh, I'm in, I'm speaking just I'm not going to say for a lot of us for me personally. Yeah, there there was a heyday mm -hmm. that I hit, we hit when we were young, mm -hmm. and we were poor. And these things were still accessible to us. Okay. And um, what happens, what happened in our situation is, you know, life has a way of really taking a bite out of you and heaping on responsibility. And I think we, we showed the culture and did a good job of showing the culture for what it is. Like it's very exciting and it's, it's very fun and the community is, is fantastic. And because of that, we created a real demand for it. And in doing that in exposing it in that way, um, we opened the door to a lot of people who 
didn't necessarily have the passion or the comprehension for it, but wanted to look like they did. Mm -hmm. And it was flooded with, quite frankly, and and this is just my opinion, um, a lot of wealth. Yeah, A lot of people with money came in and bought a lot of things and the prices of everything went crazy. Mm -hmm. And to the point where I love, I love dabbling with, with the old American, um, V twins. But what I have in, in my life right now, the projects that remain here are the last that I'll probably be able to afford realistically. Yeah. And I'm watching, I'm watching a lot of money flood into it. And that's great for the people who are buying and selling, but that's not my, that's not yeah. my business. I want to build my bikes that I ride and, and have that as, as my little safe space that I love. And, uh, and so I'm seeing that kind of come to an end and that's okay. Everything, I guess that's like the, the cycle of everything that has an authentic element to it is you'll get a lot of people coming in who just want to take the authenticity and not give anything back. And, and I'm not saying that's anybody getting into it new, but I'm, I'm saying that it, it, it did kind of bring in a lot more people who didn't have the same intentions. I could tell you that's exactly what happened with performance baggers. Yeah. I'm you know? sure it, it's these, these things are, are, a, you can apply them in any circle that has like an authentic yeah. origin. You know, and you know, I've, I've definitely dabbled in that uh, space, especially having a podcast that you have to produce five episodes a month. You become opinionated and whatnot. Dude, you do you do five episodes a month? Yes. And do you, you have to approve this with your sponsors? No, anything? no, I'm I, okay. there. They trust me. I don't have, I don't have the sponsors yet that, uh, that, you know, would require you to yeah. do that. And yeah. the main thing is, uh, you know, we're trying to get to the point we're in talks with, with bigger, more well-known brands, but you know, I, there's things that you learn to talk like when you're in a shop and then when you first turn on a microphone, you just, you're you. Yeah. And it's only, I think it's, you do a good job of that. Well, over t I mean, yeah, go, don't go back to the first 10 or 15. <laughs> Dude, I could say the same thing. There's a lot myself. of words that, you know, I had to teach myself not to use. Not nothing, nothing racist or anything. I got my, my children are mixed with black. So I don't, yeah. it's nothing like that, but it's, that's beautiful. you talk in a way that's very, um, you know, like the, the, the language is just different. And so you have to train yourself to stop thinking that you're in a garage that maybe there's somebody that is looking for the motorcycle to, to be inspired by it. And, you know, certain words might scare them away. So, yeah, that's a good, you know, point. um, and, and, and the goal with the podcast, I mean, I don't even know what the fuck it was when we started it, but what it's become. And I think it's become what it's become through the way that people have told me it's helped them the same way I'm telling you, your podcast has helped me is the same thing that other people tell me like, man, you, you know, you doing this, having these people on, exposing and yeah you do all the work man yeah you find you find the stories and and make it accessible and that just expands people's minds so you know one one of the things and i don't know i think dan might have like through happenstance inspired me this way that when i first started the podcast i thought it would i would be able to be really good at it because i had so much connections to larger brands so all the the big names and the big followers, I'm, I know them very yeah. well. Bam. I got your Dixon flannels on. I got your, you know, your Simpsons, your paint huffers, like all these brands that are hundred thousand plus. So that's the initial thing. So like I said, you started, it started out with more of a, you know, yeah, I want to tell their stories and I want it to be good, but I don't know what, I don't, I, I didn't know what it was going to become and I didn't mm -hmm. know what it was going to become for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then, uh, I literally, I did a podcast with, um, Oliver from the cut rate, who was an early guest of mine. Cause he was passing through town. He builds incredible bikes. He was probably one of the biggest inspirers of me. If that's the way I would say that inspiration inspirations yeah there's a better way to <laughs> you word check me there and um i'm here for you man <laughs> you got my back i got yours him telling me his story of just jumping up and moving to japan and learning that culture and then finding bikes and i'm like oh shit dude like i i'm coming in i came to this table thinking i was gonna preach to people and you just showed me another option in life that i didn't know existed and now then you start looking at the podcast as uh, a place to learn yeah. and 
you know, after, you know, we've got 350 plus episodes and you're six years old now. That's really impressive. You, you a lot of work. fall into these like echo chambers almost where you be, you know, I think the only thing, I, the only good quality I feel like I have is that I am able to be self-aware at some point in time in the process. Maybe not initially, maybe not five weeks in, but eventually my feelings of what I am doing on a podcast. Cause I, I, I'm very like, I'll say something and then I might think about that word I just said for 10 minutes. Like, I don't know if it was the word I was wanting to use, you know, <laughs> overthinking. I know what you mean. Yeah. I do that sometimes too. But cause you're being recorded, right? So it, yeah, it changes everything a little bit. Yeah. When you're, when you're, when there's a record of what you're saying, it's not just being passed over. Yeah. You, you ride this line all the time of, and, and on that note, yeah. Everything that I was saying about the people coming in, they're not bad people. Yeah. They're not. They're, they're just, they're seeing an opportunity and they're seeing, understanding the value of what this culture is and the potential fun that it has because they're watching what we're making. Right. Yeah. So who can blame them? I'm, I'm not holding them responsible in any way. I'm just saying the glory days that you were talking about the heydays yeah. were just a little bit different because there wasn't a comparison to make anymore. It was just what it was. What I, what I think from listening and, and all the, you know, I've been spending a lot of time on people's blogs that still have them up. Yeah. Um, and I, man, if anybody listens and you do have the ability just keep that shit up there, keep yeah, them up on the websites point. because you know, the thing is, Social media, in, in my opinion, this is this is me kind of word blurt, you know, throwing it out there right now. I'm just saying from my perspective, uh, Instagram was the biggest inspiration ever in my life because it exposed so much to me, especially in the early days of Instagram. But that that pendulum has swung to where now it's selling me everything. It's shopping. And one of the there was a phrase that your podcast with Roman and I I've, I've been preaching it on this podcast ever since to make it more intentional to inspire than, in, than influence. And yeah. that's something that stuck with me. So much. I, I, I can tell you exactly where I was in my earbuds left Michael Lichter's house. Uh, Cause I listened to Roman on another podcast of a film photographer that I like to follow. Uh-huh. So I'd already kind of dug his shit. And then when you had him on, I was like, Oh hell yeah. And then, the whole setting you like, I I'm imagining this place you're sitting in and the doors opening. It was cool, man. Yeah. It was a, in New Zealand, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was so old, old boat yard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming into Sturgis through, uh, Wyoming coming into Deadwood lead from the backside. And it's weird. Cause I'm in a helmet. I got a loud bike and I'm like leaning towards my ear <laughs> as if I'm like trying to get closer to yeah. the, to the sound pressing your helmet. Yeah. Trying to ear. like really hear it. And I ended up like playing it again. Uh, once I got home just to like clearly hear every word for it. But, and I don't know where I was going with that, but, um, fuck, where was I going it was with the that? the sound bite that you remembered. Cause yeah. J- Jason is, is dude, that guy is first class. Like yeah. he works very hard and, He's very articulate and he's a great spokesperson for, for the art of mm, photography. Yeah. Not necessarily. He, I mean, he shoots commercially. He does makes his living doing that, but he will speak to the art of photography better than most people and I know. Relatively new to it. Yeah. But I think it's just inherently in him. Yeah. Well, he's, he's so passionate and he's that, he's got that New York eye of yeah. someone who saw the beauty of a place and, um, walked through it every day. And then all of a sudden, when you understand the capabilities of this tool, he could just take it home with him. Mm. Like you get that moment. And there's a real challenge to the street photography that he does uh, too, because like, dude, it's most of the times you don't get a second try. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, for sure. To capture it. I remember what I was kind of the path I was on with that, but, um, so with, with like, I'm just, my journey that I'm on right now is Instagram a long time ago, you know, uh, you know, was inspiring. Uh, it got me in like, it got me more into photography. I, I've known photographers my entire adult life through magazine shoots. And I've always kind of nerded out around them and I've always, you know, watched what they do, but I was scared, like I said, to cheat on my craft. Yeah. I get it. You know, so yeah. I never really dabbled into it until 2016. And honestly, 
16 was a very pivotal year for me uh, because I was, I followed the money in motorcycles all the way up until that point. Um, so I'm coming off of big wheel baggers, but I bought my first bagger in 2012 to travel the country on it. But you know, I had to make it look like the things that I sold. Mm -hmm. So now it's this big spaceship and me and my buddy literally just got back from, we would ride to San Francisco, LA, Phoenix, home to Dallas. That was kind of like the, the vibe, you know? And I remember the day I got home was when 21 days came out and they dropped it on Netflix. I don't think it was supposed to. Some weird thing happened. I think I heard. Fox, it, Fox bought it. And then, yeah. yeah, it went it went to Netflix. And so I remember that day real well because I got a tattoo later that day with my wife because she was in town. And I was so I watched it on Netflix and I'm like, dude, we I text my buddy. We just did what we just watched, but on different bikes. Yeah. And I was like, you did the Lincoln highway? Some no, it was just the concept of riding oh, sure, and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, and yeah. that movie, it romanticized it in a way that, you know, the circles and the places I was around that did not exist. You know, yeah, there was always that one or two dudes that just got out and rode. And, and, you know, obviously there's tons of people that ride. I've met people that ride insane miles. Right. But that was like, man, I want to experience the road. At this point, I've already ridden kind of across country three times, uh, once every year. And I was like, man, I, I want to do it on like a, a Dyna or an FXR. I would, I always tell people I wasn't quite ready to go to a chopper because I, you know, I didn't really know anything about carburetors, any of that type of stuff. And so I, I jumped on a Dyna, but then I started hanging out in the circles of the chopper scene that was in Dallas at the time, which to attest to your heyday, uh, that was kind of almost the end of it. It from, I caught the tail end of that part. Mm -hmm. You know, we had chopper supply in Fort Worth and there was these parties for Southern throwdown. And, you know, I, I got to, you know, at the same time, I also watched the six over documentary and then I've, I'm, I'm sitting at a spot and there's Max Schaff right there. And I'm like, fuck dude, they're, they're all here. And then I, I knew of him from skateboarding back in the, in the nineties. And the whole culture, I was like, and everybody's carrying a camera around. I was like, man, maybe I should finally do that. And so I did. And then, you know, went to giddy up the following year, blew my mind. Yeah. And so all I, what I did, what I felt like I've done in the last seven years of my life, being inspired by that film and that culture was take, and, and I'm saying take lightly, I, 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 used the things that I saw that was there to re imagine for the type of bikes that we were riding. So we created a camp out in, in 18 on the vein of what it felt like to be at the giddy up campground. Oh yeah. And to provide like, uh, these newer, more modern bikes, the, a, a way to feel, you know, not that the chopper scene was like, you can't sit here, but more so to allow the, all these other men and women that were, maybe a little bit uh, too scared to go put themselves in that mix well, to have that experience. It's not realistic, man. I mean, what we do with the chopper stuff, it, it takes, it takes a lot out of a person and I can always understand if they didn't want to spend the money or had the time to risk it because it's always a risk. Mm -hmm. And the learning curve to do a big trip on a bike is pretty steep. Like there's a lot of problems you don't hit till you're a thousand, 2000 miles into a trip. And yeah, you'll, you'll never know that. And when you do hit that, like, where are you? Or is that hitting you in the middle of, you know, uh, somewhere that you're, you yeah. got no help. You don't know any shops. So I would never hold anybody against them if they didn't take that leap because they're looking at it very pragmatically. Yeah. And, but I also love looking at romantically, as you put it, to uh, what it can be. And if you do have, if you do have the room in your life to explore it, it's very fulfilling. Yeah. But but you can't expect everybody to 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 do that or want to do it. While at the same time, they could have a newer bike and hit the road and see the same places and and do the exact same road. Uh, and it's not that far off, you know, it's, it's just a, a lot of the, a lot of the, um, how would you put it? 
a lot of the stories and, and a lot of the uh, fulfilling moments come from overcoming the setbacks on the road. Yeah. Which yeah. you were fucking plagued by. Yeah. On a chopper. So there's ways to get into that. And, and really, you just have to find the right group of people looking out for you to show you what's what and, and how to get started. And, and then when you travel, you travel with them because yeah. they're going to help you. And then years down the road, you pick someone and you travel with them and you show them the ropes too. And, yeah. and that's how this thing has always worked. But I will say, you know, the, the thing about the chopper community saying it's choppers only, or you can't park there or be there. There is, there is this kind of rule that I've seen because I thought that was very elitist when I was getting into it too, but I'm starting, I, I understand it more for what it is now is there is this misery that you really need to understand mm -hmm. when you're traveling on an old bike. And when you are traveling with other old bikes, it's just this comprehensive hive mentality mm -hmm. that you don't, you don't, there's these unspoken kind of rules and dynamics that you just follow and it makes a trip run more smoothly. When you have new bikes on there, sometimes that can get complicated in, you know, they'll come by at a hundred miles an hour, mm -hmm. you know, in formation, or they'll, they'll pull the group too fast or, or whatever yeah. it is where it's like, you kind of like to put these things together uh, subconsciously yeah. to travel together. And, and that I totally understand. Well, to be fair, I, I never felt like all the events I ever went to on no matter what bike, I never felt like I couldn't sit there. Yeah. But what I was saying is I feel like a lot of people just events wise, not necessarily riding with them. Um, you know, I just wanted to, basically what I'm getting at is I found those experiences to be so meaningful and it's just some, for some reason in my nature to want to share that with other people that I have a connection with and that being Dinah's FXRs performance baggers and things like that and show them things that are more, I guess what you said earlier, like romanticized about motorcycling yeah, and not yeah, just, yeah. you know, not just the, you know, I have said coolest, most expensive thing Harley makes. And therefore I am so fill in the blank, but to your, to, to another point that maybe like for the last five years, seven years, I've traveled a lot podcasting on a bagger. Yeah. And we built an FXR chopper uh, last year for a, a little thing we put together for Born Free Texas. And that bike is a twin cam, uh, you know, high kind of a tough guy stance, almost a D-rake style chopper mm -hmm. that I can't ride that the way I rode my bagger. No. And it's at first I was like, man, I can't I can't go as fast as I wanted to go on this bike. And then one day I just like jumped on it and went and kind of rode some of the back roads around my house and I cruised at a different pace. And I was like, whoa, this feels different. And so what, what I'm, what I'm coming into is I've experienced the country at 90 miles an hour plenty of times now. And there's, there's a part of me that wants to experience it at 70 now. Yeah, dude. Yes. And there's yeah. a part of me that wants to, you know, which I've gotten to that point where I don't, it's not the destination. It's all the shit in between destination is the inspiration to get on the road. Yeah. Um, now it's like, well, that before it would be okay. Well, we're going to blast I 10 to get to born free. Yeah. But now it's like, well, you know, maybe it's a little bit older, whatever. Maybe I have a little bit of, I'm, I'm curating enough space to be able to take more time to do it. But it's all about trying to f go through these towns and these parts of the country that are like way off those those interstates going east and west, yeah, right? That's it. It's not it's not about going fast anymore. Yeah, it's not. It, 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 you can build a bike to have the capability of going fast, and that's great. That's awesome. That's really fun to pursue. But you still want to travel with your friends, and you still want to you know you want to hit that sweet spot where you're seeing everything as well. As a photographer, though. It's hard when you're doing 90 to stop oh, and go dude. get that shot. You it's just passed. It's hard at 70. It is. It's, and, and on my, on my pan head, you know, when I make these episodes on YouTube, it's very expensive because I, I have to, I never make anybody 
rehearse a shot or, or do anything. Like I will ride a hundred miles an hour ahead of everybody. Fucking throw down my kickstand. I a shot, wait, you know, them mm-hmm. blast by me, grab it, jump on my bike to a hundred miles an hour, catch back up with them. Nice. And it's on and on and on through a trip that really, I do a lot of maintenance on my bike. It's very expensive. <laughs> you put it through the ringer, huh? Put it through the ringer. And uh, it would be more practical to do on something different. But I, you know, I've also built that bike to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but my favorite part is just being able to cruise with my friends and get some of those riding shots where you're shooting off the bike and you're seeing their reaction to something yeah it's priceless yeah it's fucking priceless and and that happens at like you know between 70 and 80 well it and you know (laughs) i don't have a cruise control that's another thing i'm i'm learning to live without Uh, you don't have cruise control to just pop it on real quick and then stand up and start ripping shots of all your buddies and stuff you gotta you got to be a little, you got to learn how to shoot with your pinky on your left hand a little bit in some spots and, yeah, yeah. you know, or find these unique ways to, to shoot. I, I mean, trust me, I did the. It, it uh, helps to have a foot clutch. Oh, it does? Because my, can, my left hand's always free. Oh, okay. So I can, I can ride with my clutch and my brake through corners with mm. friends and I've always got a hand. Yeah. That's, that's okay. That free. makes sense then. And, and so if a foot clutch really, really helps. But yeah, so that's kind of like the, you know, the, the path that I'm on and, you know, I don't, I, you know, honestly, I kind of want to build, I want to chop a sportster first. Yeah. That's a great place to start. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, being 41 going on 42 now that the one thing I would say that I'm starting to realize that I like is that I, I have more patience that I, I feel weird saying that because I don't feel like I do, but I, I'm not like, oh, I got to. This summer I have to be on this sporty chop. Right. You're it's not more attacking like, it. This summer I got plans. And then this winter I want to, you know, I just want to weld at the shop every time I get a chance. That's a realistic way. And then this things. winter I want to maybe tackle a different project and, you know, and then maybe later on next year, things might open up to be able to jump onto a cone shovel or, man, honestly, I'll, I'll fucking run an Evo. You know, it's kind of, it's to me, it would be nice to have generator shovels or pans and all this stuff, but they're not accessible anymore. Financially, <laughs> they're just not. Uh, you know, I guess maybe to the what you were talking about earlier about um, they're so expensive. Well, if I have to have it, then why do I have to have it? You know, why do I have to have that bike? And I don't have an answer for that. So my answer might be because I think that you think I should have that to be in this scene. Right. No, that makes, that's a, that's a really great way to kind of render that down. Yeah. You don't need, you don't have to. And unless you if, have a reason that is personal. Listen, I'll, I'll tell you this and it, and it happened to me. I don't know if the community is still there that, that makes it work like this, but the, the way it worked when I was getting into it is I had people that recognized my interest in it. And when they saw my commitment, they made everything available to me that I would Mm. need. And you just put in your time and it's not like this anymore, but you know, when, when I was getting into the big twin scene and the guys that I was learning from and, and buying parts for, the attitude was like, don't worry about your knucklehead. You know, you'll get there. It'll find you, Mm. you know? And, and (laughs) I don't know if that exists anymore because the price of knuckleheads have gone up so fucking much, but you know, you, I started with an iron head. They saw the bike I built, went on to a cone shovel. They saw the bike I built, you know, the, the pan head came about the same way. It was an unfinished, finished project by a guy who Mm -hmm. knew that I would finish. Yeah his project that he never finished. So you just start yeah, and put your time in with what you can do. Don't think about starting out with a, with a fucking pan head or, or whatever. It's like, what are you capable of with the skill set that you have? And people will recognize your potential and try and enable you mm. because it's a supportive community. Yeah, that that's for sure. I always say that with, uh, you know, when people want to learn certain things or ask me questions about certain things, I'm more proficient at with paint. 
I'm their question lets me know where they're at in that process and whether or not I should help them or not. Not that I don't want to, I want to help everybody, but yeah. if I tell you how to do all that, then you're, you're not, I don't know. I don't know if you're going to have the same connection to it, but if you start trying to do it and you hit that one roadblock and you ask me that question that lets me know what phase you're exactly. on. Exactly. Then exactly. I can you, give you that one little piece that puts, that yeah. connects everything together that, you know, I've seen that you've, you've come to that point to where that question needs to be asked. I guess that's it. When people see, when the right people see you making your own way, They'll try and help you get there. Yeah. It's still the, uh, you know, maybe, maybe complaining. I don't know. I don't want it to sound that way, but a weird thing about doing a podcast and having a lot of people listen to it. And I think a lot of people think, well, why haven't I been asked to be on it yet? Or, you know, I have enough followers now or whatever the case may be. And it's, I'm saying this based on my own feelings, my own, like, uh, you know, man, why didn't that company do a magazine thing on me yet? I feel like I'm doing cool shit. And I'm constantly have, that's one of those things I'm working on. Like, fuck you, you keep doing you yeah, and be true to this. And then things will find you. Like you said, the panhead will find you. The, yeah. And, and I get that every once in a while where I feel like people are getting antsy. Like, like I know who they are or they do great pain or they grow, build cool bikes, but I haven't found the, the angle to converse with you yet. Yeah, yeah. You know, I haven't found how to do a podcast with you that I'm truly enamored with interest, not to not saying that you're not an interesting person or you don't have potential or all these other things, but I, I, I don't want, I want to do you justice. And until I feel like I can, I'd rather let you keep living and growing. You Dude, know, you gotta, you gotta listen to your intuition yeah. right there in your nose, because I can tell you're, you're a good judge of character and you are insightful and, and self-aware. Um, and you'll get there with anybody given yeah, yeah. the time, but you know, you can't, there's no point to risk it until you know. Yeah. Because your, pl- your plate's full. Obviously. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah. And, and listen, man, I've, I, I've never felt like I was in the middle of any circle before. You know, if, if you feel, if anybody feels like they're on the outside and like, why isn't there being a magazine article or this, like every, everybody feels that way. Mm-hmm. And, and when you, we're, we're exposed now to a lot of the opportunities are, that are there for everyone because of social media and because of, of what gets streamed to us yeah. with immediacy that sometimes it can feel like the world is passing you by and that like what you're doing isn't, isn't interesting, but it, it is. And the body of work is the reward. Mm-hmm. It's not what other people think about you. And, and I can tell you right now, you know, we'll, we'll finish this and this is a great afternoon. It's awesome. I'm glad. I'm just very thankful that you stopped by. And oh, thank this. you for letting me. Yeah. But it's no comparison to what you feel when you put this thing together and finish the audio, master it mm-hmm. and put the music in there. And you, you have this little piece of art that you send out there. Yeah. That is the value. It's whatever you make, whatever that medium is, just do that for that feeling. And don't worry about what you're missing. Yeah. You know, and, and I live out here. I tr- I'm a homebody. I'm a hermit. But because I put work out, the right people come around. Mm. And I'm not, and I'm not pursuing it. I'm not waiting for it. I just keep busy and just keep, I keep pursuing that intuition that mm. we're talking about, whether my intuition this day is finishing uh, an edit which takes me forever. I have so many of them to work on at a time, or if it's pulling me in the garage yeah. or if it's getting on YouTube and, and kind of um, doing my homework on something that I want to build. Mm-hmm. Cause there's a lot of great information on there uh, or making a parts list for that matter. When I feel like, yeah. man, I got to give some attention to this bike. And I just, I know these parts that I need to do. I need to look them up and, order them. It's just finding time to do that. That can be fulfilling. Yeah. You know, that can be that part of that day, but worrying about what 
you're getting passed up by it's it's just not constructive yeah for most you know for anybody listening like i wouldn't wouldn't put much effort into that and also as i'm i'm ranting about it it's like i think you you said something really great about romanticizing and taking from what you're inspired by and putting it into the community that you're you are now that can be that's more practical and application than say trying to emulate what you see. Yeah. It's like, how do you adapt that? And that's where the real creative um, application in what you're doing comes from. Yeah. Yeah. So when you can, when you can look at one thing and see how it applies to another, that relative, that understanding of relativity is what we see as art, Mm -hmm. I think. And, and when you can, the straighter line that you can draw and the quicker you can draw that and the better you get at drawing that is what makes you an efficient artist. Mm. So I, I'm always looking at everything that way. Yeah. I'm like, what can I take from that and, and apply it to what I'm doing in my little space right now? And on and on we go. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, from being, you know, the early design background, whether it was shoes or whatever we talked about, you know, you, you kind of want to look in other areas for inspiration to bring back to your area. Cause if you're only looking, for example, if I'm only looking at other custom painters for ideas, then my custom paint will look like their exactly. bikes. Yeah. But if you find color, you know, concepts or color combinations in other areas, or you look at like maybe the way some trendy graphic designs are starting to come out in different you know, whether it's, you know, open up a cosmopolitan magazine, which just has nothing to do with motorcycles or paint. It's all design. But there's design in there. Yeah. There's layout, there's yeah. typography. Yeah. All of that. Letter forms fascinating. Yeah, they man. do. I love looking at letter forms. Like yeah. I will redraw something a thousand times till I understand it. Like yeah. this little logo, the the too far gone at the top. Yeah. I was like really trying to figure out where that came from. You know, I'm I'm like, what is this? I know it. It's Coca-Cola. Oh, you know, yeah, I see it now. It's very much Coca-Cola. <laughs> and I figured that out after the fact. That's you know? actually really rad, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, man. And I do that continually. It's like this, um, that logo up there. Yeah. The the blue tide on the skull. I was like, where the fuck? I know this. I know this. It's Hot Wheels. It's Hot Wheels with yep. a death skull. Yep. Uh, and, and, uh, it's really funny to, you know, yeah, explore it in, in hindsight sometimes. Exactly. And that, so that I take that same, you know, um, I don't think I consciously knew this, but I think that inherently when I, back in my early days of painting, I looked for inspiration. Other And I got that idea from somebody. Yeah. Um, for sure. I, you know, you know, when you start, when I ride this bike and I had a blast at that, and I'm like, man, you know, when I go back to where I'm from, cause I, like I said, I get like, I get to be at spots like this, you know, or, you know, said spot all over America and different scenes, different types of bikes and, you know, or even not even bikes. It might be just different, you know, whether it's music or art cultures that I get, you know, to be in circles around when you just take, not, t- I, I hate to use retake cause it seems like I'm stealing. Right. But when you just use what you've experienced and try to find a way to bring that into your scene, whatever that looks like. And to, to evoke that same feeling. Yeah. That's right? it. Yeah. So, you know, when, when we started our camp out a long time ago, it, it was, it's simplistic. There was no vendors. There still is not vendors. It was all about just getting people to get on their bikes and try the road, you know, try to figure it out. And then when you do, you know, most of these are modern bikes. So the biggest issues are typically not, you know, bikes breaking down, things like that. But it's weather because yeah. of the time of year that we, we, um, do it at. So in a the lot Midwest of, too. Yeah. Yeah. So you get a lot of, uh, you, you got a lot of weather challenges if you're above interstate 40, you know what I mean? And then it becomes, well, do you not go because there's snow here? Cause there's not snow there. <laughs> so it's not, you know, and w- over the years it's been different for people, but when they show up they're they're, they, as they, as they migrate from different parts of the country, the, the, the packs get bigger because they link up with these other people through social media and 
they form friendships on the road through people they they didn't know, but they had this common place they were going to. And then they, they leave with like, oh man, I'm going to hang out with that guy again in a couple of months. We're going to do another trip. Oh dude. And, That's the point. And year after year, that web just grows and exactly. grows. And you, and at this point, a really people like you and I can go anywhere in the country yep. and we have a support system anywhere in the world. Yeah. It's crazy. When we went to New Zealand, when Nick and I went to New Zealand for her dad's wedding, we were driving around, we borrowed a car. We went all the way down to Invercargo where, uh, the, the, um, the Monroe museum was, mm. and we saw the Lance B car. We went to the beach where he set the records and, I posted a picture of that and I got a flood of messages from guys being like, Hey, are you in, are you coming to Dunedin? Which we were. Yeah. By the time we got to Dunedin, they had set up, you know, there were 20 people at this pizzeria waiting to hang out and we had a great night. They were all, a lot of them were meeting each other for the first time. Mm. Turns out there is a little chopper community there mm. that, is really hard to get choppers down there, yeah. especially street legal, but they are doing it. And mm -hmm. one of the guys, um, Andy is, uh, oh gosh, what is Andy's last name? Sorry, Andy, I'm gonna look it up right now so people know that he was one of the people's champ. Oh, okay. So he's coming to uh, Born Free. Oh, that's bad. And, and yeah, and we met all those guys in the same night just because, you know, the road and, and the community that brings Andy Martin, sorry, okay. Andy, um, Andy Martin's chopper is fucking badass, and he's going to be riding it around America this That's summer. Cool. And we're going to try and do some time, but that, that happened on the other side of the world. Yeah. How wild is that? That's that's exactly uh, that I've seen it happen. I've been a part of the other end of that. I've been the the person that's meeting people through coming to hang. I've been a part of the the person that people came together to hang, which is always humbling and awesome, but also weird, yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But yeah, and, and that I think that you know um, through those processes, just seeing like I feel like there can always be another wave of great, right? I think so. Yeah. Like it, it's never gonna. I think one of the things I, I, I'm not really sure how I can word it yet. I'm, I'm, I'm not the best with, with words. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a feeler that like trips over myself for about 10 minutes till I get the, the <laughs> thought out, but whatever your process, when you're, <laughs> yeah, when you're, you know, we, we've been hosting the same thing. For example, we've been hosting a bike night in Dallas in deep Ellum for seven years now, every Tuesday. Um, and sometimes there's two people, sometimes there's, you know, 70, 80. Right. Yeah. But what I've noticed is the, the waves of the people that have come and gone. Right. And then I've also noticed how like some people are more connected to one of those waves. But then I also realize when some people are connected to what wave it, the wave that's going on now, and then you see how they might not be that enthusiastic about being a part of it. And I always try to remind people like, look, this shit doesn't last forever. Yeah. So don't be lazy with your time and energy because it it won't be here before you know it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's good advice. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. But let, you got to let things die too. You know what I'm saying? So Dude, you know what it, I, it also, I'm, I'm having a resurgence in that wave in just a different form. Right okay. Now. Yeah. And it's, it's in the vintage flat track community. Because okay. there's a handful of older guys who are, they're still riding and they're still actually fast as fuck. Yeah. And um, you get humbled thinking you're going to go out there and there's a guy in his late sixties, yeah. like smoking you, mm. you know, it's in, in on an older bike. Yeah. It's amazing. And there's, there's something really, really, uh, Gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's something, there's a lot of merit to what they're doing out there because they're risking a lot. These, these older gentlemen who have maintained and ridden these bikes since the sixties and seventies, because one, their bikes are fast as fuck. And there was a whole journey to get that bike to mm -hmm. perform on that level. Um, two, they know how to ride. Mm -hmm. And in 
I'm just getting into to, into that community, but I'm feeling the same aspirations as I did when I was yeah. when I was embarking on the, this journey into into choppers. And uh, these these older guys are looking to pass that down. And um, the thing that I really like about about the racing aspect is uh, you have you have to put your money where your mouth is. Like mm -hmm. you really have to learn how to ride one of these things. Yeah. And, and it's, and if you, if you really distill it down, it's flat ground, right? You're riding a bike to the sliver of death <laughs> on flat ground. Yeah. Like the whole idea is to perf make this thing perform in a way that if you are just the slightest bit off, you know, you're eating shit. Yeah. And that is the maximum performance. You can ride this thing at, in the simplest of formats, Okay, just on flat ground. There's something very beautiful about the simplicity of that mm. and of, of mastering that. And, and it's just amazing to watch these seniors who have mastered that still be able to do that on the track and beat 16 year old kids. Mm. And when I, when I think about my aspirations in where I've come to in the, in the bike community is like, I want a community that's strong and has that aspect to it. And I want, I want the guys that are older to still be willing to, to teach, to be educators. And I find that there. And so I'm having a resurgence. It's just in a little bit different form. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm also looking at it the way that you were talking about it. It's like, well, how do I take from this aspect and apply the romance of that to the chopper? And, and look at that bike right there. Yeah. Tell, tell oh, me. That's an OG. Flat no, that's, one. that's, that's an OG speedway bike. So oh yeah. 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 Tell me that that is not the most, that is not the sickest chopper stance you have ever seen. Well, in, in the Dyna culture, we call that the, uh, the gangster lean. That is gangster as fuck. <laughs> And, and so I'm sitting here looking at that bike every day and I'm like, all right, I'm taking, I'm taking notes for maybe, you know, one of these next projects that's, that's going to come up. Yeah. One in, in the aesthetic, that line is perfect. That's the undeniable line of a motorcycle that yeah. you can, you can't look away from. So it has the line, it has the chopper line and then applying the you know, the weight aspects that they've gone through and the performance aspects. I mean, that thing's got it all. It's got the sissy bar. It's got the fender. It's got the D rake. Now I've just got to, you know, I got to see where that fits yeah. in applying that to the highway. Well, could you, do you ever think it's like, uh, you, you know, one of the things I've been asking a lot of the guys in that are more heavy in the chopper world is like, how do you pick one style that like, you know, how do you not love them all or want to experience them all? Cause they all ride different, right? Yeah. You know, high and long, yeah. high and tight, high, you know, uh, you know, I the know, brat dude. style, I like know. every one of those bikes gives you a different cross country trip experience. And it, I love looking at all of them and you want to, you want to build one of all of them, but the real, the reality of it is dude, it's so much work to maintain yeah. and so much money and time that, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. Cause I'm overwhelmed by it. <laughs> I will like, say that every time I go and tell myself I'm going to build a long bike out of this, they all end up being my stance, yeah, which is a more athletic kind of perform performance as yeah. a chopper can be, but nimble, yeah, yeah, nimble bike. It's uh, almost like you build the like your body and you your, do, yeah. you do, because I get on Snake's bike and I look fucking dumb, like I look like a little kid wearing his dad's suit. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just all big in places and it just, it doesn't fit yeah, right. Yeah. So you, well, there's that, right? Cause that's what I've, you know, a lot of people have been asking me like, Hey man, was it feel like to ride that FXR or chop? I'm like, all right, I feel as cool as I'm ever going to be on it. I feel like it's a bike that, that I think speaks to my stance and so far, most of the, you know, being a photographer, it's hard to get shots of you, you know, but so far I feel like I kind of, I like the way I look on it, yeah. you know, if we're being, you know, you know, self-aware, self-conscious there, but 
you know, yeah, after, you know, 500 miles a day or, or 300 a day or whatever, like it, your ass hurts. It, oh, you know, dude. It's my God. Yeah. There's a, there's a pain tolerance thing that goes on, but there's this, when I get off, my body forgets it for a few minutes and then I feel cool as shit again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then like you said, the, the aggravation of like your, you know, it's almost like a, a tiny toothache that doesn't quite hurt, but you feel it. So you're thinking about it. Yeah. It's yeah. how your ass is on these bikes and stuff. So, um, but yeah, I, I completely understand like how you might fall into a, into a style that just, you feel like fits who you are as a person. Almost. Yeah. It fits you physically yeah. and, and what you want to kind of that romance of how you want to ride it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, like I told you, there's one paved road here, Yeah, but there's, you know, thousands of acres of dirt roads. Mm -hmm. And so any bike that I build, if I want to go anywhere, I have to be able to ride it on the dirt. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really take a lot of pride in being able to fucking keep up with people on dirt bikes on a chopper mm. on some stretches, you know, nice. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, the, you can do it. It's yeah. not, you shouldn't and yeah. you'll hurt for it, but you, you can do it. <laughs> uh, so, so that, that influences sometimes. To, to kind of wrap up some of the book talking, you know, I, I don't want to take up your whole day, but also there's a few other things I'd like to get into Dude, if you please, can. by all means. Um, you know, to, to kind of wrap up the book, do you feel like that was kind of a, like a beginning or an end to a part of your life? Dude, that's a great question. That's a great because question. Because I'm asking it as, as a guy that read it and then yeah. has followed what you have available since then. It was honestly more of an end mm. and, um, it had the potential to be a beginning, but that was pretty much the last book advance that I think the publishers could give, you know, a, somebody like me who wasn't, uh, have, didn't have a yeah. celebrity following you know, that doesn't really exist for no name writers or artists anymore. I think publishing is dying because they're one, because they're cowards, you know, and, and same reason movies suck mm. because they won't take chances on stories that, uh, we, that don't have an audience built into them. You know why I, I've all, I grew up in magazines, uh, like many people our age. Books only recently have hit for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's embarrassing a, a, a bit to say, but at the same time, like, I'm glad I, I'm finding it now. Mm -hmm. Another new at 40 years old, I'll take it. Yeah. But to me, the direction that social media has gone, the only real inspiration I find to be, I, I feel like I'm getting is from publishing, whether it is a magazine, not not really current, Matt. Like, I, I love Dice. I get everyone, uh, I've been capturing like the Ripper and Roller and stuff from Japan, but I've also been going down the rabbit hole and getting older dice magazines that aren't available anymore and, and finding these other like chopper mags and these, uh, they're so these special. zines yeah. that have been, they were all out and they were, there, there's so many of them. They're so special. And so my, my listeners are going to be so sick of me after this trip from me telling people this, but my wife and I have curated our living room to be more of a place to hang together and can like read or look at magazines. And as a, as a photographer fan and an aspiring one, I will open your book once or twice a week. One might be to read a passage. The other one might be to study a photo to see what you saw, to, to be aware if I find that, Yeah, you know, um, yeah. I do that all day long. Yeah. Here's yeah. My <laughs> I'm not a bookshelf. Yeah. I have a container full of, of that exact reference material for inspiration that I just need a bigger house. So it used to be Instagram. It, Instagram was that. Yeah. And there's still a lot of great photographers, but I would tell you like this, like if you go to Kirpius's page, I don't see his photography there. I feel like it's somewhere else well, that he, dude, I don't he, know how to get my hands on. You know, if you're able to talk about it, you know, the the Jason Momoa project that's going to be starting to drop. I know you had help on that. Yeah. We and shot, we shot that over the last three years. Mm. Been a lot of work. What do we have to look forward to in that? You have a lot to work forward to in that. Um, <laughs> as far as the bike aspect goes. Cause it's not just motorcycles. No, it's, it's also like the rock climbing and the other things he's interested in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's a lot of different, um, very, um, interesting communities, 
that, mm. that he's telling the story of. And what what's, it's not unlike what I'm telling Harley to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and me telling Harley like they would ever listen or just what, yeah. my suggestion for, for what could prop up a community that sells motorcycles, whether they like it or not. Yeah. But what Jason did with On the Roam, and we already have a season two. Oh, like nice. it's already, it's I already mean, done. It's not done. But we still have to shoot it, but yeah. we, we've been, we've been given a season two and I'm just a camera operator in all of this. You know, I, it's like, I, <laughs> I had to sign paperwork yesterday about being, uh, there's a few episodes that I'll be riding bikes on, but, um, I'm mostly operating a camera in the shows. Um, the, the format is to tell stories of people of influence mm. who are inspiring, just like the whole reason you started this podcast is yeah. because you were inspired and it's giving credit to where credit is due. And, uh, and if you can embrace that, I hate to say it, but you can sell anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I don't like to sell anything through my artwork, but I realize as I get older, if you don't have a wealthy patron backing you, yeah. You have to sell something. So be careful about what you put your name on mm. because consumers are getting savvy. And I think everything Jason has done with his branding and with his show has been uh, really authentic and, and well thought through. Mm-hmm. Maybe not so well thought through when we were shooting it because there were a lot of times we were like, <laughs> what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> you know, how is this going to fit in? Yeah, yeah. And, and lo and behold, you sometimes you just got to trust the artist because yeah. it's it's something that's that's pretty damn special. Now I'm excited for it. It's it, you know it couldn't come at a better time. I think 2024 has got a you know we haven't even talked about bike riders, but just in general, like having these motorcycles on more or less the bigger screen. They're hitting the mainstream now, and yeah. you know like you know uh, I I just you know I think about that too because you know I, I have a 14 year old son who does not care about really? any of this he will hopefully he will and i'm optimistic but you know i gauge you know things off of him because he's like my my window into his generation you know um my daughter is 22 uh she's kind of my window into her generation right, right. But she's my daughter and we we're close and so she has more of a like when she sees a bike it's it reminds her of me Right. Therefore, we have that connection. My yeah. my son's like, until said rapper or musician that he follows tells him to ride that bike, he's not interested in that bike. That's, until Fortnite that's, puts a bike yeah. that's a Harley, he's never going to care about a See, Harley. That's so sad because we're uh, uh, we we have really dumbed down a population into this celebrity driven branding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this equation is tragic, man, because we're only going to see shit we know recycled and recycled and recycled. So instead of like, hey, let's put said guy on the bike, similar to what, you know, Harley did when they released the the 18 soft tails. I think what it's like getting your bikes in the stories or telling bike stories or in the movies to where it's not so much that the most famous guy in the world or popular guy in said genre is on a bike because that looks like you're selling me something. Yeah. That's influence, not inspire. Right. Exactly. If you put exactly. that bike in a TV show, a movie, you, you put a storyline around it. You have some good visuals that, that becomes inspiring. Mm-hmm. And I think inspiring, inspiring sells more things to people that I think that it, it connects with. For the right reasons. Yeah. You're going to get more lifelong customers to people that are inspirable. Yeah. You know, some people are just not. They're always chasing the, you know, this is going to get me popular. This is going to be that. And hopefully everybody comes to, I mean, if you're living your life, you're, ha- you're having good times with that. I'm not mad at you. Do you do you? But Well, here's here's the risk you're running if you, in, and right now, the, the brands that, have the money to, um, include these famous people to sell. They, they have a built in metric. It's going to reach fans. Their fan bases are this big. We can track all of that. It's, it's, there's no risk involved anymore with them. 
in their reach. In, and so they're making these decisions uh, based off, off of, of those, those things and the cultural influence that these, ha- that these people have on them. But the risk they run is like that is still a trend and it will die eventually. Yeah. And when you look like you're the dick sucking celebrity like, yeah. brand and that's no longer applicable and people want something authentic now from, and they want to know what's under the surface, what's not mainstream, which it will come to that. Like when you pivot, you just look like an idiot. Mm. Being, being, pursuing authenticity is always a good decision in, in whatever story you're trying to tell, whether it's a story of a product that you're making or a story for the sake of, of inspiring. Mm -hmm. And we have lost all courage to do that in, in advertising and what we see on television you know, it took someone like Jason Momoa at the top of his career to be able to tell these stories of people like Max mm. or, or whatever. And, and, you know, um, that's something kind of sad about that because those stories are great on their own. Yeah. Without someone like Jason, no offense. Yeah. To have to be the one to fight for them. Yeah. Like it shouldn't be a fight. This is what we should all be pursuing our interests in. And our popul- we're dumbing down our population to, to look at these these people to be like, what should I do? And, yeah. and that's, it's so dangerous. Yeah. It's so fucking dangerous. So a fun, like on, on top of what you were just saying, like about trying to get the metrics or looking at metrics and seeing how much you can, how many, how, how many more people you can kind of uh, get this in front of their eyes. Reach, yeah. Well, you know, Harley's already a million follower brand. Why not focus on inspiring those million people you already got? And then those people will tell their friends and use a little bit of old school marketing with a little bit of new school marketing. That's why we use older bikes. Yeah. You know, that's why we're trying to break that rule that they have. Because if you have a 10 million followers, it doesn't mean that your brand's saved. Yeah. So no, not at all, not I mean, at all. And, and they're, they they run the biggest risk of all because um, if they continue the way that they've done it, they're going to die. Yeah. Like that is, that is the scary fucking part. Like if they don't start embracing some of the, some of the lifers the community mm. that's, that has popped up because of them, we will all be living the the dead brand yeah because it won't survive what well, what about you know i i think about how much i gain through deeper conversations like these having being able to be in a place of a deeper conversation with those types of people that run it being able to say what you say on more or less an ignorant scale of what maybe we don't know about why they if there is something behind the scenes we don't know about and having that, well, the reason why we have to do this is because of this, this, and this. Okay, well, you go from a, a place of conversation and, and educating each other on the feels or the facts. But then after those are on the table, then you can have a conversation of, well, how can we do this? Yeah. Yeah. It goes to fixing the problem. Yeah. It, instead yeah. of like, instead of, you know, uh, pointing back and forth, it becomes, okay, well, how could we bring this together? And you're part of that conversation instead of, instead of it's like they're selling the bike to you and they got to go back and talk to the guy again, see if the number's okay. Oh, my guy said, we can't do that number. I'm like, well, dude, bring the guy here. Let's talk all together right yeah, now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Dude, I, I don't, I don't know. Look, like, it's, it's funny to sit here and, and speculate and I don't have anything to do with the brand. I don't, I've, I've worked, I've made a few of these projects third party yeah, through yeah. Jason because he trusts me with a camera and he trusts mm-hmm. me on bikes and, and, we have a team. We're yeah, the, yeah. on the Rome team that he's built to do the work that he needs to get done. That you know, you you can't just hire someone to shoot off a bike. Yeah, like yeah. that's a very dangerous. Uh, you're taking a real risk. Like yeah. this, it's specialized, and he's built an awesome crew of people to get those shots. And and we move very quickly, and and we we do these things. But we could never do that if we involved Harley. Mm. has to be third party 
because when you do a Harley shoot, which I did work on the 2024 model year campaign, which is about to come out. Yeah. Yeah. We move very slowly and it's, it's very, um, me, how, how would you put it? I, I don't have a good word that's not derogatory towards it or just, I don't want to put them down. They have these teams in place, but they're very inefficient. Okay. And they're coming from different worlds. When you hire someone who produced, let's take your pick for, um, let's say Pepsi. I said Coca-Cola earlier. I don't know why soda's on my mind, yeah, but yeah. one of these big institutions, they, let's say you, you put someone in as a creative director that came from there. Mm -hmm. They're going to build their team from who they know. So they go and hire their friends from wherever they came from and they bring them in. And now you have a bunch of people who aren't involved in motorcycles now making decisions for motorcycles mm. and becomes very inefficient. And sure, you told branded stories. Pepsi is not a lifestyle company. Coca-Cola is not a lifestyle company. What you're dealing with is a lifestyle company and you need to fucking know that lifestyle if you're going to be telling stories for it. Yeah. But they don't hire people to tell those stories that are from the culture. They hire them with, that already have big paychecks and big, you know, resumes from other places. Mm. So they have suffered from that, doing that over and over and over again. And let's say, let's say you're that creative director and you're shoot, you're sitting down with, Rolling Sands. The only questions you know how to talk about are soda pop. Like, where is that going to go? Yeah. You I know mean, what, you know what I mean? Like that, that's just kind of an, an example. So the same thing applies when you're building a, a creative deck or whatever, you're going to miss some major lifestyle questions to go over. Or the nuance that, that creates that. That's exactly it there. You know, to get to that point where you understand that nuance, that's a lifetime commitment. Mm. So you need people who have made a lifetime commitment. They should, they should study David Mann paintings. Here's a great topic. Why did they never embrace David Mann? How are you going to give an ad campaign to Kid Rock yeah. and not talk about David Mann? Yeah. These, these are problems. These mm -hmm. are problems inside the company that they will not, you know, but that doesn't. Sometimes it feels like they want to erase certain parts of the culture that that's around what they are and they have and that's tried that's culturally what's going on in a lot of areas but finding a way for every brand to embrace where they came from what was created through their products and just own it and you don't have to glorify the bad parts or any of it but you have to acknowledge it exists and it and it and it pushed you forward it gave you what you needed to survive that's exactly you know? it yeah. They have tried for years to erase that aspect, mm -hmm. which was the, which was the most iconic aspect of their brand. Now they're starting to catch on. And yeah, like those little hints are there. Like you can buy a cut off sleeve denim vest from Harley Davidson with yeah. patches on it. Like, that's really funny that they sell that now in, in, yeah. in Harley. Like they're starting to understand that that is hugely influential and largely what people are chasing when they go to buy a Harley Davidson. Mm -hmm. The doctor lawyer uh, crowd that they marketed to through the eighties and nineties no longer buys bikes. Yeah, It's people like you and I who are getting a little older. We've lived a life in some of these other subcultures. We've made some money. We're, we're looking to make an investment that is, more convenient. Maybe we can ride with our partner, with our wife and go on these long trips. You can haul your podcast gear. This now becomes a part of your business. Mm. These are the people who are buying bikes from them now. And it's a statement. It's still saying I'm within this brand and I'm still related to this aspect of history that it created. But to ignore that entirely mm -hmm. and only suck the dicks of celebrities to sell your shit does nothing but a disservice to the loyal lifetimers who will eventually be buying your motorcycles. Mm. I mean, we might go buy something else if it pops up because you, you've really done a disservice to what you created. One thing that we do with our sponsors and it's a, you know, the concept of like, I'm going to have this said brand, you, me, whatever we're selling, you know, obviously things that we, we, uh, we agree with or we, we want to put our name behind, but 
what I'm getting at is um, when I make it a point that they, it's a, it's a cross, it's, it's a two way street of working together because they'll never help you. Yeah. If, if you, they'll never it, help you. If you don't, you know, like if, if I, you know, as Simpson is one of my biggest connections, if they are not give, like showing me as their guy, they're just using the yeah. podcast to sell whatever they want to sell, then it doesn't, the, I don't think that the people believe us. No. You know? That, and that's exactly it, man. You're losing your, your fucking foundation. Yeah. So, you know, having a lot of influencers, you know, the influencer thing too is a... Uh, is a, is a strange one as well, because there's an influencer, like there's a wave of influencer culture where I've been saying this a lot on this podcast trip. So I'm sorry again, but what came first, the desire to be an influencer or the motorcycle? Yeah. That, because, that's a trend that's going to die very hard. People need to yes. be very careful in how that they present themselves. If, if they are presenting themselves as an influencer, you need to move away from that. Yeah. Cause if you, if you love these motorcycles and you love all, all this stuff about it and you have these experiences and you get compelled to tell the story of what you love, wh whatever medium it, it is, a, a podcast, a, a, a photography, making videos about it, all these things are inherently more, they're going to, they're going to live on the shelf much longer because they're coming from a place of, of honesty within themselves and honesty within why they're doing it. It's genuine and authentic. <laughs> and you know, when you do the, the other way, you kind of, in my opinion, well, I'm a little optimistic in this. And I, I always say I am down with whatever got you to Harley's, whatever got you on this bike, you know, however it may look to the bigger picture, just, just fall in love with it. Like if you, if you come because you wanted to be an influencer and then you, this looked like an easy place to exploit, but then you fell in love with it and then he changed you and it turned you into like somebody that's going to be here forever. Thank you. It's part of your journey. I love that. Yeah. I'm not mad at that at all. You know, so there's, but this, this is the taking we were talking about. Yeah. This is the people who are just taking from the imagery and the iconography that we're creating. And they're putting this on now, like a costume and saying this, this fucking I'm cool. Every person that I look up to, no matter what, what type of bike they're doing, but they do things that are more or less inspiring to me. And I said it to you before we started this podcast, it's always funny that the most interesting people are telling other people's stories, you know, and it's that's funny you say that, but yeah, I, th I think you're right. You know, uh, yeah. Oliver cut rates, got a series on YouTube. That's phenomenal. Uh, he, he, he's going and telling these stories of people that he's met through his life and his own life is is phenomenally a badass story. So it's like, you know, when they're doing that to me, they're 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 adding substance and layers that, that people can consume and find more connection and more uh, you know appreciation for this stuff. Well, and that's that's giving back. Yeah, that's what that's I'm saying. That's not taking. That's just giving back. So when you have all these people that should be just like turning the camera on them by today's standards of what we consider YouTubers to be, but they're choosing to make it about the person in front of them. To me, it's a, it's just a, it's, it's different. It's, it's more like, it is like, maybe they're just like trying to keep this alive and keep it feeling the way that it feels for them. And, you know, dude, that's when I, when I go out and shoot a trip on the road, yeah, I just need to get it out there. So people know the difference because I know there's this wave coming now that the influencers or, or whatever mainstream attraction that some people with some really um, wrong intentions are going to come in and try and show this for something that it's not. Mm -hmm. And it's going to end up being on TV because they'll put some celebrity in front of it on a chopper and it'll be a show where they go around and they'll, they'll show it this way and it'll have planned stops and there'll be a production crew and they'll have lunches and they'll, but they'll make it look dirty and grimy. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that's what the experience that people are chasing. I, I feel a real sense of urgency to get material out there and accessible to people that shows them the difference mm. to what it really, what the experience really is because they need, they'll eventually need the comparison Yeah, once yeah. it launches into the mainstream. So I really just try and, and shoot an unplanned trip with all of the aspects that make it 
fun or all the aspects that make it hard and show that person at their best on the road and at their worst on the road Mm. and tell that story. Because if it's left up to the people making the decisions that show it to the rest of the world, they're going to fuck it up. They're going to cut out all the things that give it uh, real life. All, oh, we don't want to make this look like a hard thing. We want to make it look easy for Dude, people. And oh then my God. they don't realize that the hardships are what makes it. Right? Oh my God. We Snake and I worked, we developed a show for years and um, it was called Roads Untold. And we had some, we had partnered with a producer from the BBC and one from Vice at the time. And this was going to be a, a show. And at the time we had built our, the Chun was kind of our castle and that was an interesting place. They wanted to make the setting and where we'd go out and do these trips and tell the history of the United States as it was paved through the number system of its highway. It was nice. really great. I wrote 12 episodes for this. That sounds thing. like an interesting thing. Two years of work for me. Anyway, it did not happen because uh, the... Two executive produce. We actually, we there was a point where we were shaking hands on the 35th floor of a major network and we were off to go make our show. And then the two executive producers whose names were on the uh, copyright f- had a falling out and sued each other and the whole thing got sunk. But they would not let us show the breakdowns and they, they, their, their terms were that and that we had to have planned stops with either conflict or introductions to other characters. Everything was planned along the way. Thank God that that thing fell through because it would have just, they, I know they would have, once we had, would have shot that for them, it would have gone to into their you know, editing suite and come out as something totally different. Do you think that in the future or now, maybe I don't know about it, that's possible to get funding to do things like that through YouTube? Yes. I, and, and I have, I have hope that the right partners will come along and see what I'm doing with, with that kind of travel, uh, documentary and say, you know what? this resonates with people. There's an audience. It's inspiring. It checks all those boxes. Don't change it. Here's enough money to go out and shoot six episodes in a summer. Yeah. Whatever, whatever it is. And, um, that's kind of, and I was talking to Mike Wolf about the way he got his show started and he was, she shot like eight episodes himself. It's kind of with uh, a couple of years himself. Richard Rawlings actually did that too for a um, gas monkey. Yeah. And I was just like, I needed to hear that because I'm not necessarily doing this to, to sell anything. I just want to put it out there. So people remember my friends (laughs) Yeah, and, and saw them at their best on their road before this thing totally goes away. Because the truth is we're the last of it. I really think that we're, things are going to change so fast, very quickly that to be able to run these gas vehicles will either become illegal or only financially available to very wealthy people. Mm. So before this goes away, I just want a good record of how fun it was. Mm. That is uh, pretty heavy on that. I mean, I, but like I was just saying, I like popped in my head. Why, why not have somebody that has a passion that has the money to kind of back a couple projects, start a YouTube channel, almost like you would do a network and allow yourself to have, you know, within this culture, these other shows that are coming in and, you know, the network's job is to find the, the promotional things to, to fund the project so that it all works. Yeah. You know, and next thing you go, you have a channel that's just no different than our motor trend, but you don't have all the shit yeah. all the other word, all the other sign offs and all the other things. And, you know, Dude, if you think of a way to do that, I'm, I'm figured out, man, maybe it's, I don't know. I'll maybe we just got to sell make you drugs. A producer on this thing. Yeah. <laughs> could, could make it happen. Um, but you know, on, on that note, there's two more things I want to jump in and then we can wrap this up. Sure. Um, your thoughts and your, uh, I know you're passionate about this project and you had a little bit of, of time on it. The, the bike riders coming out, like, are you, you know, I know you're excited about it. Like, what do you think that's going to do for us in on the positive side of things for our scene? If you kind of said the negative of what's going to come out of it. Well, 
on on the bike rider specifically, that has been a story. Mm-hmm. I forget when it was published. Um, I mean, it, it has been out there for a long time. Yeah. And culturally it has, um, it has a cult following. Yeah. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of expectation behind it. Mm-hmm. And I only worked a day on it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's hard for me to tell, but I did have a lot of quality time with the director in spite of just the short time that I was on it. And I can tell you that his intentions and his intuition were dead on mm. with, with what he was trying to, to tell. I haven't seen the movie yet. And so my experience is just limited to that. And um, I think people need to realize going into it that this is a fictional story mm-hmm. adapted from a book that we love. And I read the script. The script was really, really excellent in the way that it was crafted to incorporate a very fragmented book. Mm. Would be a very hard story to tell, but Jeff Nichols did a fantastic job of crafting it around the photography and around the conversations that were transcribed from Mm -hmm. the the recorder. Not an easy job. Yeah. Still a fictional story. (coughs) So we kind of got to let go of some of the um, expectations that we have in this being the bike rider's book. Mm -hmm. If you think about the book and you read the book, these, a lot of these characters (coughs) were not all that likable. Yeah. (laughs) And, and like Benny, who's the hero in this film in the book is a real fucking dirtbag. Yeah. He's like, Oh, it's child support, not paying it. You, that you think he beats Kathy. Like, you know, that these are terrible qualities in a person. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't ever really (coughs) be able to make that exact story in, in cinema. Yeah. And if you did, it couldn't be, through someone like Disney, you know, and, and I always think that like, if you could make a more direct movie about the real, real life version of something, it always is more interesting. But the the truth is it'll never get made if you do that because the people writing the checks will never allow it. So what we're going to get from the bike riders, I think is going to be as good as it possibly could have been yeah, yeah. under those constraints. That's me kind of uh, tempering my expectations for what I'm about to see when it comes out. I think that the, I remember it was a funny thing once. Remember the movie Warrior? Yeah. I, I love that movie. Yeah, and that was a good film. Tom Hardy was in Tom that Hardy, too. Tom Hardy, yeah. yeah. And um, in that thing, there was, you know, obviously, if you have ever been in or around the MMA world, then it's highly unlikely for them to do what they did at the end of the movie where they had a, this, like, death match, like these these rounds, you know, like a, like a tournament, you know what I mean? Like a karate tournament, you could do that, but yeah. you can't beat the show each other for 30 minutes and then go in a locker room and come back out three hours later sure. and beat the shit out of each yeah, other yeah. again. Not but, realistic. And I remember in this shop I was working in, one dude was complaining about it and the other dude goes, it's supposed to entertain you. Yeah. You know, and in, in the entertaining there, it's supposed to kind of, you know, for the person that it's going to connect with, it's supposed to inspire you. Exactly. And, you know, obviously there's always going to be, uh, the smoke and mirrors when it comes to uh, telling a story within the time, within the confines of like modern, whatever the the medium you're telling it under, right? Sure. 90 minutes. 90 minutes, right? Plus, it, plus a major studio who's on yeah, the hook for people. People are always like, oh, the book's better. Well, the book didn't, I mean, maybe it had a cap on pages, but the book. And it didn't have to be PC. Yeah. You know, it didn't have to be the, these things that culturally would never be approved of to get made yeah. with a $40 million budget. Yeah. So I, I think that the best way to look at this is the same way that people should look at Sons of Anarchy. It is a, it is a, 
it's a play on something that does exist yeah. and it's designed to entertain you and inspire you. If, if that's your cup of tea, in my, in my opinion, it, it shows the romance. Yeah. And, and I will say though, like after, and I read the script several times because it was that good. I will say that I cannot in my head think of a better way mm. to do what Jeff Nichols did on paper, yeah. as far as the script goes in, in connecting years of photography and fragmented conversations into a comprehensive story of an outlaw motorcycle club that did exist during these decades. And that's what he did. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I don't have a constructive word of advice to uh, explain the script any deeper than that. It, it, mm. Aside from maybe, maybe the one thing I could suggest, but you could never do because the movie wouldn't get made. But if you showed Benny as more of less of a hero and more of a human. What is it? Like more of the anti-hero, right? The, more the anti-hero. Yeah. Th that would be a little bit more accurate. But then again, like you said, we're telling it to entertain. And so... I kind of dismiss my reaction to that. You know, the only reason I suggest that is because um, uh, Into the Wild was a great yeah. book, influential book for me as a kid. And when that movie came out, you know, after, after reading Krakauer's kind of, you know, interpretation of this kid uh, at, at a young age, I thought of him as a hero, right? I thought he was a very heroic character, character yeah. did his own thing. Looking back on that now as an adult, I realized that guy suffered from mental fucking illness mm. to the point where it got him killed. Yeah. That would have been way more of a compelling story. It wouldn't have inspired people the way it did, though. But it did, wouldn't inspire people the way yeah. it did. It would have been more compelling as a character development, less inspiring. So, That's a good point. You know, it was kind of like we have to make these decisions when you're doing something uh, like what they're, what they're doing with the bike riders. It's still a fictional story. Yeah. So probably a better decision to tell something more inspiring. You know, and this is, you know, this last kind of question here is kind of more along the lines and still within the film world of creating movies, short films, whatever. Are we ever going to be in a place where we can literally have, movies tv shows films about literally anything motorcycle related but clubs <laughs> oh my god i know what you mean you know the the yeah. story of or the we've been talking about this entire podcast your book is about it and it's kind of i'm leaning into that is yeah. the concept of how amazing and how transformative riding motorcycles across the country can be from the the kids that did the 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 dumb and dumber thing over this year to you know getting friends together and travel like all the the story is there or the the baseline is there to tell a great story that can be uplifting motivating have all the like you said the uh the um the opposition or whatever you would call it the uh, the conflict within it you know um it's the great american road trip and that will always be reason enough to tell a story, in my opinion. Yeah. But people writing a check for, and, and, you know, I've been in conversations about having Too Far Gone. Yeah. Turned into a film. And with some like A-list actors who wanted to do it. And I can tell you their, their heart is in the right place and they want to tell the story the right way. Um, in my opinion, I don't know if that's their story, though. Like, I, I, it'd be a hard one to let go to be done unless I was doing it myself. And no one's going to take a chance on a nobody. To, have you ever, have you written, written a script or anything? You know, I've written that script. I mean, yeah, I, have, yeah, I actual... have it arced out and, you know, it's halfway written as a script in its first draft, but the arc is there. And for me to finish it, I'm going to need to get a development deal because I just don't have time yeah. with everything that I have going on. And the, if I do all this work myself, 
the reality of it is, uh, and if I do all the work as, as in writing the script myself and trying to get the deal done myself, it most likely won't get done. Mm. That's just the world that we live in. But if I am able to make a cultural dent in what I'm doing now and become someone that people respect as a storyteller, there's a chance where I could get the money from someone to go back and write this story and have the time and, and resources to do that. Would, you know, cause I know you've acted, I mean, we, I've seen a lot of, a lot of one, is that how you put it? Yeah, yeah. So can, I mean, is that something that you would do yourself or would you no. put it? Yeah. That's a weird no, one. Right? No, no, like, I wouldn't, I would never play yeah. myself, but I would, I, I did the, the conversations that I was having earlier on, um, the, the, the conversation was based around me playing Ethan. Oh, that'd have would, been cool. <laughs> which would be really fun. And I've done, I've done a deep dive in the character studies. Yeah. <laughs> my closest friends, you know? Yeah. And, and he, he's, he's, he's such a developed character in real yeah. life, you know? And, um, but I don't know that I would, I, I don't know where that would come in. I probably, probably not, but yeah, yeah. that, that would be the only, only way that I would, I would probably consider doing that. And, and by the time that I realistically would, would get the money or the, um, authority to do something like this, the resources, I'll probably be aged out of it mm. by then. But, uh, so by that time there'll be a whole nother league of actors that are in, in the yeah. zeitgeist. But that's the fucking sad part is I could never get the money to do this without a celebrity coming along and saying, I want to make it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's so frustrating. It doesn't matter how good the story is. It doesn't matter how inspiring or how many people it could potentially reach the fucking cowards making the decisions to, to send these films into life will never take that chance. Mm. What if you did it with a cape on? <laughs> That would, that might do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as, as a, uh, you know, big comic book fan, I've always loved comic books growing up and, you know, to when Marvel started doing what they did in, in 2008, that was a connection that me and my son shared together. That's cool. So watching those movies um, and staying connected and, you know, obviously what kid doesn't love Spider-Man? Dude, what a franchise they've yeah. made with these. And so for me, that whole that whole thing has been something for the last, you know, up until recently uh, was a 10 year span of my son and I going to movies together. That's really cool. You know, and, yeah. you know, now... You know, I've, I've heard people say, oh, well, it's just there hasn't been like a great story that's been out. And some of the stories that, that, that have been chosen to put the energy and effort into to make a movie hasn't really resonated with, I don't think, my generation much. No. You know? No, yeah. And, you know, now that and I think that they wonder why movie theaters and going to the movies is going away. And it's like, well, you're, you're either making stories. You're making movies for people under 20. Yeah. And people over 50. Yeah. And so the idea of going to watch a movie has kind of been pulled away. I'm actually interested because the movie that just came out with Zac Efron and the, the Iron Claw. Iron Claw. That's, that's, I grew up with that. That's the wrestling. The, the No, the Dallas. That is where the Von Erics were based out oh, of. Oh, okay. And they were my parents' age and not in my parents' like friends group, but in the circles that my parents ran, right, right, they were right. a part of it. So I, you know, my family, we'd be at uh, the drive-in doing races and, oh, that's the Von Erich car right there. Cause they'd be in all this other shit. So seeing them make a movie about it, I'm interested because of my connection to Dallas and being in, in the eighties as a young kid in the back of a car and you hear their names, you know what I'm, I'm saying? guessing the reason that movie got made was because one of those actors took a interest in that oh. story because it was presented to them mm. on a pile of stories, potential movies that they could be involved in. Mm. And they read these scripts and they said, this one yeah, sounds really yeah. interesting. And so, so that's what you mean by it has to be an actor to yeah. green light things now rather than 
the the latter. Yeah. Or it has to be a a director that every actor wants to work with Mm. who says, Uh, I want to make this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're like, I want to make a movie with you. I don't care what it is. I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, there's been a handful of great movies that have, that have resonated with me, but you know, visually like as being surrounded or trying to surround yourself with photography and then wanting to be better at making videos or whatever case may be, you start to look at movies in a different way. You start to be inspired by the way they light, why the way they compose, the way they so much more. It's a different experience now for me to watch a movie than it was 10 years ago. Right? Yeah. It, 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 you, once you see how the sausage is made, it's kind of yeah. hard to, <laughs> hard to eat it. <laughs> um, but you know, like I, I wonder, I, I just hope, I, I hope more than anything that, um, after this movie comes out that maybe people that are in positions to tell or, or, or make things happen, or like we said, the YouTube idea, you can get more people to start looking to just turn this page of the motorcycle world over for the next layers of content that I could think be, you're right be interesting to tell a story that's different but yeah along the lines of that motor so I, the the what is it the the fastest indian i liked it it was a family friendly movie uh, it but was, i liked it. it at at its time it was exactly what was being made but you know the craziest thing wild hogs yeah the premise of that movie is joked about like and you hear it in other things hey why don't you you have a midlife crisis go buy a harley or something you know <laughs> yeah but the the case the the truth is is like it it like that story could be turned around on another angle played seriously and it could have been a, a very interesting and uplifting story. I agree, dude. I really do. It's a friendship, yeah, and it's the road, and it's a very simple equation. It's it's kind of like the it's the hot tub time machine story, honestly. Hey, we haven't been together in forever. Let's do this thing to get us back together. Exactly. And then you have an adventure, you know, a little different, you know, play on, you know. Uh, you know, enemies, if you will, but yeah. the concept. And so I just feel like, uh, you know, it, it would be nice to see movies that, that are showing be, because what it will also do to the culture of motors, the, the bikers, right. It'll, you know, the, the, the t- tough guy, cool guy, the, the outlaw, it's very romantic, but realistically, I, I feel like it's, it's sometimes I wonder how the it's, hell it's the only thing that ever gets shown. Dude. Yeah. It's so sad. You need that. You need that Coen brothers take on it. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that kind of like strips all that away. Or, what was that? Uh, the, what was that Kung Fu? Remember that show TV show? It was like old, it was real old. And I guess the guy that was the Kung Fu, it was a Kung Fu or Samurai. Or, this dude kind of walked all over the place and he was, walked into these stories and it could be that biker just going and oh, walking yeah. in the stories. Yeah. yeah. There was a show mm. for a period of time. Um, I, f- I think it was on CBS. Uh, and then came Bronson. Mm. It was a guy on his sportster, just his friend commits suicide, leaves him a motorcycle. Oh, that's a good story. Line. And he just, he just takes off and he's dealing with that, uh, loss and he's riding around the country and he's meeting, people he's meeting women he's getting in trouble he's fighting his way out of it he's looking for work and i don't i think it only had one season but it was great and it was in the 60s and the guy's on a fucking cool little sportster cruising around the country it was it was beautiful i did forget what i just asked you you okay let me think we were talking about um then came i was saying about then came bronson about a television show that wasn't uh or a uh some stories told Around, that yeah. weren't club related. Dude, I'm drawing a blank, man. Okay, well, well, then, then I'll go back to then came Bronson. Um, it's it's probably mid to late '60s, I'm guessing. So all the cars and all the bikes in it, it. are the fucking coolest. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. You said earlier, um, you were talking about like this the the age, like we're we're in an age almost of something that's going to transition transition back into like tactile uh meaningful uh i'm trying to regurgitate how you said it but i guess what i'm trying to get at is my feeling i feel like we're, we've been in this place of like influencer blah 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 like everything's on, on like everything's for sale yeah right 
And I feel like there's there because everything's been for sale and because everybody's bought it and they're still unfulfilled in their connection to whatever they bought that it's we're working back into an age of buying something that does more for them personally than socially. I sure hope so. And that's why, not that I have the answer to the recipe, but that's why for me, it's becoming books. It's becoming blogs. It's becoming, you know, I, I'm trying to promote some bike shops to start, you know, every, every bike shop in every town and everybody in every town has the homie photographer that gets all those great crispy shots and does all this and whatever scale photography they're on. I've been trying to say like, why don't you as a shop, why don't you have a bike night that is air quotes, like a chance for him to print some workout and show off his work at the bike night at the shop or yeah, do like some simple ways of giving back to the artists that, that I not, I'm going to say take you, everybody takes from, but I don't mean it like, like uh, aggressively, like you just stole it. I just mean like, it's, it's, it's helpful, you yes. know, and you give know, back. Yeah. Yeah. Give back. And no, that's, that's a great call, man. I think we're moving. I think we're, there's a lot of focus on, on mental health right now. Yeah. And on people are pursuing things on a deeper level. The whole psychedelic movement, um, ayahuasca, mushrooms, psilocybin, uh, these are indicators that people are seeking more than what a consumer life can throw at them. Yeah. And when the sad part is the consumer world is going to catch on to that and pivot for that yeah. too, and still try and sell you something inside of that ethos, right? Trendsetter follower, trendsetter follower. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. So we, I think even in that cycle, we will go back backwards to something uh more authentic more genuine um before it it kind of gets you know exploited again and people will discover what you did they'll discover printed materials from you know however long back and yeah. they'll be inspired um you'll go back to things like William Blake and, and poets and, yeah. and uh, illustrators and, and will appreciate the analog stories passed down at a time when not everybody could read and not everybody had access to view, uh, you know, a real printed copy of a painting or, a, yeah. or something. And, and hopefully we won't take those for granted, just as I think that we will, we won't take gas powered cars for granted. Mm. You know, I, I, I think there's some real liberty. I, I'm very excited about electric vehicles. In fact, I just bought, I just bought a, um, a zero, mm -hmm. you know, the electric dirt bike. Yeah to it we've built a camera bike out of it to nice uh, mount big cinema cameras on because there's no vibration and and this thing is impressive dude yeah. it is so fucking fast and smooth it's insane and it gets an impossible shot and i'm i'm very excited about that technology but i'm i'm also thinking that we're going to get a deeper appreciation for the mechanical aptitude that we had in this internal combustion engine era and for the, the freedom that it gave us, mm. it's like, there's a gas station most of the time, every time you need it, yeah. you can just take off and go, no plan, no nothing. Yeah. Like, um, there's some real liberty to that. Yeah. And I think we're, when we're making this transition, it might kind of be rough. And And I have my own opinions on electric vehicles. I think Personally, I think we need to find either alternative uh, fuel sources, um, how to make synthetics or something ethically and, and sustainably and run these cars that already exist and run perfectly fine. Yeah. Find another way to give them a different fuel source. It, it, rather than mining, strip mining the world for minerals. Because if yeah. you look at a fucking oil field, which I had plenty of them where I grew up at and plenty of friends that worked in them versus a mineral mine. Yeah. Boy, dude, that is 
you want to fucking be freaked out, go yeah. go check out what the world's going to look like. The mineral mine looks like what you would think a Star Wars planet that's being mined looks like. It's exactly. It's, yeah. It looks like Mordor. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. And and that's the plan we're putting in place. It's like decaying the earth. Oh my God. And, and the fact that it still runs off of fossil fuels mm. to charge your car. And unless your grid is completely been converted over to solar, which most are not, a few out here in the desert are, which is neat. But you're still charging that vehicle off of fossil fuels. So what have you really accomplished? Mm. Yeah, there's definitely going to be. Or I I I don't like talking politics, but everything everything that matters right now is being spoken at through a political standpoint yeah and and it's not being spoken of in a way that is pragmatic it's not to solve the problem it's to point fingers at what they're not doing but you're not really saying you're going to do it either so it's like uh, it's just and and i think that what you said about people's mental health while ago i think that that's also on top of the fact they now don't know what the fuck's going on in america they don't know they don't have the feeling they thought they were going to have after they bought the house, bought the car, bought the grill, bought the jet ski, put the kid in nice schools. Did like, you know, I don't like saying that money can't buy you happiness. I think money can do a lot of things to give you the opportunity to find happiness, make it easier to find. But uh, maybe not. I, I'd, I'd say that with a grain of salt. But what I know for a fact is when I see people who spend a lot of money on a bike and their intention was to gain friends, uh, notoriety, admiration, whatever, because of what they bought social status, social status, and it doesn't come for them. Then they look at the bike, like they got the wrong parts. They brought the wrong bike. They, they blame the thing they spent their money on, um, instead of the thing that they're doing on the thing they spent their money on. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's going to happen in the, in the, uh, in the vintage bike world too. Yeah. For anybody oh, yeah, who's for sure. coming in, who hasn't done, who hasn't done the work in developing the community. I mean, that is what they're missing is yeah. the community behind. But they things. want the community, but they want it given to them as easy as they bought the thing. That's exactly it, man. And, and nothing, nothing is that convenient. Like nothing valuable is that exactly, yeah. you have to build it. And, and the, uh, what they're seeking does not exist for them if they don't do the work. And, um, hopefully people will be willing to, to pursue the work and not just that end goal. Yeah. And, and when they start to really render it down, th- this is, this is the way that, that, uh, you, you achieve these things they'll be passionate about that yeah. and just accepting where you're at and, and being grateful for wherever it is you're at. And, and to answer your question, sure. Money doesn't buy you happiness, but if it can buy you things like healthcare uh-huh. or afford you the ability to put a roof on over your head when your old one blows off, whatever that is it, like that kind of stability affords you the luxury to pursue things like mental health. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we should all be kind of trying to understand that when we assess financial risk in getting there. And as an artist, as you know, that is a really scary prospect Mm -hmm. because you can work very hard at building something and building, uh, that security that we're talking about, but it's still, if you don't have a wealthy patron or aren't born into money, it still comes down to that next opportunity, whether that comes or not. And sometimes that doesn't come and that things get really fucking scary. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I, you have kids, which is, um, that's, that's a real achievement, man. And oh, I grew up with them. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I, I, I'm really happy to hear you say that. And I think my wife and I would have children if we did have more of these opportunities that would have kind of fun that we were, we were somewhat calculating when we, and don't get me wrong. I love, love my life. And, and I've been really, really grateful for every opportunity I've been given, but kids aren't really an opportunity until we find some level of stability in that. And that, 
is kind of the next thing that I'm pursuing. It's not building another bike. It's not, you know, it's how do I use the art that I've made now in creating the stability to move on to this next chapter? Yeah. And, um, the fact that you've done that is really awesome. I think you should know that yeah. people like me look at that as a huge achievement. That. Yeah. It's, it's more like, because I had kids very young, I didn't, it, it was, it's more like trial by fire. You don't have a choice, right? Yeah. You either show up or you run away. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and like I said, I always say my daughter and I grew up together, you know, her birthday was on the 11th. Uh, she just turned 22. That's awesome. And to me, you know, the kids aspect is, is tough because, you know, I'm not with two different moms. I'm, I'm not with either one of them. I wanted to, I tried my ass off, but I, I, I'm an artist and I, and I, I, I crave change. I crave evolution. And sometimes that could be hard within, within, within people that don't, you know, for Absolutely. some people change. And you can't force it. Yeah. You, you gotta accept, you know, like, uh, you, you let people be who they are and love them for that, the truly loving them, you know, or accepting them. And for me, um, I have, I have a wanderlust that was introduced to me in my thirties. I've curated my entire life to scratch that itch, but also, um, like handle my responsibilities. And that's the great you know? balance to have. Not everybody finds that. Yeah. So but you've also been intuitive enough to like put those puzzle, puzzle pieces together throughout your life to arrive at a point where you are now, where your interests are your income. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the funny thing is, as I embark on this 20th year of more or less being self-employed in the motorcycle industry, most people would say they've been 20 years in a job that they don't love and or they're not as passionate about when they started. They, they feel trapped. They can't go anywhere. And they want to do what I do. And I'm kind of in some ways feeling like I want what they have. Dude, I get it. I know. You know, the stability. I know. Yeah. The, the decisions that I don't have to make every day. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, so, but I know that my inherent nature, that would probably not last or work long. But as someone that, that's trying to be open-minded to everything, I, I feel like maybe, maybe there is something out there where I can still be valued in the way that I, 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 I feel like I'm valued as a, as a independent creator, if you will, or whatever you want to call it, independent, you know, business guy, whatever. So if I find that, then I, I want to be willing to maybe, you know, go be the best thing I can be for another brand or another person if that came to that. But, you know, don't get me wrong, like the podcast pays bills. Yeah. But you made it, that. Yeah. I, yeah. And you connected all those dots. But the podcast, like I can't just... You know, if I let my shop go, if I, if I just said, you know what, I'm straight. That's why my friends that would quit and do YouTube, I'm always like inspired by that because sometimes I feel like I got to quit one of my jobs and just take the risk, take the chance like you did when you jumped on that, that bike that time, you know, and, yeah. and see what happens. But I am also scared as fuck because I, you know, my daughter's grown, but I got to be there just in case. No, you know? for sure. And that's good to keep in mind. When I, when I took that chance, I evaluated that risk is the timing in life. I mean, my rent was like 400 bucks a month yeah. at that point. And, um, I, I had saved up a good amount of money after eight years of working for the same corporation. Mm-hmm. And I had got, the other thing was I had gotten as far up the ladder as I was ever going to yeah. get with them. And that's great. It, but the next step would be cut, becoming a lifer, which I knew I didn't want to do. Mm. And I was pretty much over snow sports at that point, which was a good time because, you know, we were on top then. Since then, I don't know what's happened exactly, but I know after I left the industry took a turn and a pretty sure they let a ton of people go, which I probably would have been the first. Yeah. Yeah. So it was the right decision at the time, but I didn't have anybody depending on me, man. Yeah. And I had, I had no reason not to. Yeah. It was like the end of this road was right there in front of me. And the, my choice was to run it right into the wall or 
take this exit. Or to it. allow them to control the narrative or you it's, take it. Yeah. Exactly. And I knew what, what was coming because that that's the cycle inside of those action sports companies is a, a lot of times you hire a kid young out of school, you know, you promote them, you get them as far to a per certain point of salary and responsibility as you can give them. And then you cut them free and you subtract that st salary, start someone else from the new yeah. and you know, you're paying someone way less. It's the concept of why we don't really have those jobs where you start at 18, 19, 20, 21 and retire from anymore. No, you know, and that, that American dream mm -hmm. is dead. Yeah. So we're trying to figure out what the new American dream looks like. And I think you are it. Maybe. I think um, you're doing it. You're I, using I'm not, you know, I, I, I think I'm also, we're, we're also the thing of, uh, we saw what Facebook looked like when you let our parents on and messy people on. Yeah. 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 And a Facebook became a place where, okay, that's too much information. And I think that Instagram kind of made us show the highlight reel mm -hmm. and Facebook showed the ones that are, you know, very aware, like we don't need to put out the negative things, not because we don't want to be real, but we just don't want to like put that out there. It's poison. And it's, it just yeah. spreads. Yeah. And so what that inherently does is it just makes this culture of like people that seem like they have perfect lives. And I far from that, far from, that. you know, um, but then again, that is also a matter of perspective depending on, you know, I, I look at your life here. I don't know much about you other than what you've allowed the world to know and what you've allowed to show me while we're here. But this looks like a life I could, I could enjoy, you know? Yeah. You know what? Y use your intuition. And th for example, this place costs, the, I call this my knucklehead house. And I've told this story before because y there, there was a bike that I wanted to buy. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the time it cost as much as this house when this house popped up on the market at a time when this neighborhood was undiscovered and it was, it was still, uh, it was a place I had found through motorcycles mm. and knew that it was special. Didn't know much about it. And, um, I basically bought this house on scene for $30,000, $29,000. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was my knucklehead. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, I can let that go for a place to live and being able to read the trend in real estate ahead mm. of time afforded me the life I have now because I can take risks and I don't, I don't owe a mortgage. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and this place, I have 20 years of plans, but I can build it as I have the time and the money while I have a roof over my head. Yeah. Yeah. The stability. Yeah. Like yeah. you were talking about. Yeah. That's, you know, I, I don't own right now. And uh, so I'm fortunate because my mom kind of let us have a house, but it's not really mine. I'm just paying the mortgage and it's, it's cheap. Yeah. Um, and it, it checks a few boxes, but it, it, there's things that I need and my wife and I need. And, you know, so, but we think about, well, if we want to be truly homeowners and, you know, be in a place where we can make the changes. Cause I live like in this, like not in Dallas city, but in another city where you're not, you can't just add a shop in the back. Oh uh, yeah. You know, yeah. you can't just do things like that. So, you know, the, we're like, well, we would have to give up a lot of conveniences that we've gotten used to growing up in the places we have. But in order to have something that we feel like is ours, first off, we had to come to the point where we wanted to spend that kind of time together, mm, you know? Yeah. Yeah. True. And I think that we've always said we wanted to, but I think it's in this recent time that we've really become like really best friends through a, almost a 10 year marriage, uh, you know, that we're coming up on. Um, That's impressive. And with that being said, it's like, you know, like now it's like, okay, well I can live in the country now cause I'm down to be with you alone for five days <laughs> versus before I'm like, ah, I need some, I need to be around some other people for a while, you know? Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> so it's, it's that. And I think that with that new perspective or that new, op that, that new way that we're living together, it opens the doors for, um, things that we didn't really think about before. And the fact that, you know, I don't, we're, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to have a $350,000 mortgage. Dude. I, I'd have to. That's like the going rate for anything. Now. Everywhere, everywhere. You know, and you know, not, which not everywhere. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, you know, if I could sell, you know, if I could sell a bike and, you know, find a place that checks boxes for me the way that this place checks boxes for you. Yeah. Then for sure, you know, I, dude, there, I'll, I'll tell you this, they're, they're out there and you won't find them easily. Mm. Just like I didn't find this neighborhood easily. And, and it's blown out now and the prices are fucking stupid. It's starting to stabilize a little bit, but it's proximity to Los Angeles just opened up the door and, and oh, oh, globally, like uh, there are this, this place went ballistic in, in people who were buying homes here from, from all over the world. I, I've never seen anything like it. it was a land grab, but these places exist. And, mm. and if you, have that vision, which I know you do as an artist and can see your life and, and your paint shop over here and your podcast studio over here and, and like all these two lane highways that can take you wherever you want to go mm. out from, out from this one little hub, you know, if that's your fantasy, you will find it. Mm. You will. Yeah. That's a good point. And I think that's kind of what this trip was about with, with her is just, you know, being present and, you know, starting the year off inspiring you know being around people that are inspiring going to places that are inspiring going and go being able to go home with like a, a drive yeah you know a drive to kind of like push through this year and also as you know and we really do wrap this up um just being whether I, to me i can be in a car on a road trip or i can be in a bike and i'm peeling on the layers of the of my mind back on like figuring out things in life you know or at least asking questions to myself, do you really want to do this? And so doing this road trip at the beginning of the year, it's like, you know, not a new year's resolution, but like a, a, a past year's like assessment. Did it confirm anything for you? I think so. The same way that I asked you if that, that trip that you took was a, a beginning or an end. And I feel like this trip is an end to last year mm -hmm. as much as it, I think I can also spin it as being the beginning for this year. Yeah. Is that it? I mean, it's convoluted. It's a little Confucius, but I, I think it is that. No, it can be both. Yeah. It can be both. And I think that's the perspective to have too. Um, because you're, you're open-minded. Yeah. In, in probably taking in a lot more than what you understand right now anyway. Yeah, and, sure. and it'll be very, uh, relevant to you when you get home and start applying what you may have absorbed subconsciously uh, or through osmosis, whatever. Yeah. And, um, and that's why travel is good for people. Yeah, for sure. I, I got to remind myself of that too. Yeah, cause yeah. Can't be a homebody, man. You can't be. <laughs> no. What, uh, so, you know, Got plan. I mean, there's, you have a lot of projects coming out soon that, you know, with the, uh, Rome, uh, looking forward to that coming out that you were had a hand in Yeah, yeah more podcasts, right? More podcasts. Um, I'm working on an episode right now that I'll be cutting the rest of the day. That is probably another month of editing. Really? Oh Damn. yeah. When you get through sound design and, and unscripted material is so infinite because it's, it's like, it's kind of trying to shape infinite options into mm. one storyline. Yeah. It gets very challenging, but, uh, you know, when I'm happy with it, I, I let it go, but it, it takes a little while. Uh, but the, the biggest thing that I'm trying to do this year is get that camera bike working more for, for movies. Okay. And so I'm, I'm going to have to build a website and get the footage. I've only used it on three projects but get that footage together and, um, and get that out there to get some work. But, uh, Scott Topher and I shot a short film last year that we would love to get, you know, it's kind of a proof of concept slash turned into short film for a flat track movie we'd like to get made. Mm. And so we've got to finish editing that and whether we just launch that on YouTube or try and put it through film festivals or maybe just go, to the contacts we have to see what potential it has. Mm. I don't know, but that's, that's going to be a big part of this year. It's getting that done. A, a small, a, a big ask maybe, or I don't even know if it's possible, but like, as I said, as a, as somebody 
finding a lot of the things that you and many other people of your peers have created years ago. Um, finding a way to like, if people, you know, to be able to absorb whatever you may have written or shot, uh, you know, that's, that's something I think that is important to keep around the same way you talked about earlier about, uh, you know, trying to tell stories that, 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 that will last longer than these bikes are going to last probably. Yeah. If you will. Yeah. So I don't know. Or us. Us for sure. Yeah. You know, but like I said, I think that we're moving into an era where those things that you guys did are going to make more sense to us that, that weren't a part of it. And now looking for that real tactile, uh, you know, whatever that is for each individual. But, you know, I, I've been trying to encourage people to do more blogs, you know, to, to show more photography in that space. Cause it's not compressed into this I know. muddled photo, and you it's know, not this big. Yeah. Yeah. Be, be, and, and to not only do that, but go look at it on a computer screen rather than your phone. Yeah. That's that way the next step. you can start to see things at a, in a different scale, which will change how it feels. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Then the interaction is important. And you don't want to watch a movie on your phone. You will on a plane that you don't want to watch Oppenheimer for the first time no. on your phone on a, on, on a plane. Like you want to see that in the way it was designed to be experienced or hear it or hear you it. You know what the, the, the extent they went to on the sound design on that movie was insane. My buddy uh, did the sound design for, he does them for all of Christopher Nolan's movies, but he worked so hard on Oppenheimer. Mm. It was just like, it's an astronomical. Yeah. Test. And if you, the, the bike, there's, there's yeah. a cop bike in there. Mm -hmm. That bike is my bike. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's the sound of it. Is, yeah. Is yeah. Bike. Yeah. I heard that you had a, you had a sound package that you sell to, to yeah. Uh, license. Yeah. I yeah. want to make, I, I would love to make more of those this year of different, like I do a British package and a, because it, it's, it's hit with so many people. And when you, it's kind of funny because I made, basically made it for myself, for my YouTube channel, um, to develop those stories and the quality on those. But then when you start watching other YouTube stuff, you realize it's like, man, there are so many people shooting motorcycles that need the sound, like all sorts of bikes. Yeah. If you go down the rabbit hole of motocross videos on, on YouTube, it's bananas. There are so many high quality, well-produced, um, feats of cinema shot mm -hmm. with, with, uh, motocross guys that have no sound, <laughs> no motor sounds. And it's kind of like, <laughs> should probably make that happen. Nice. Yeah. Well, uh, Todd, I, I really appreciate you letting me come in here and do this. And it, you know, it's kind of, uh, I was a little nervous coming in here. I'll be honest with you. Oh, dude. It was, uh, drop it at the door. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, I, you made it, me feel comfortable. Thank well, you. Good, <laughs> but man. it's, uh, like I said, any, anybody that I feel deeply inspired by that I don't personally know yet, it's always going to feel that way walking in the door. Right. But sure. Yeah. Um, I've been there a hundred yeah. times. Yeah. And you know, like I said, I, the book is amazing. I hope people can figure out how to find it. I know that it's not in production anymore, but there you know. are some copies left because when the distributor runs out, which I've been notified that they're out now, the, that means that everybody who's stockpiled the book, um, like say Amazon or whatever mom and pop bookstore, um, ordered the last of those copies. Once those are out of circulation, once those have been bought, there are no more. So there, there probably are some copies floating around somewhere, but yeah. the, the distributor is now officially out of print. Do they, in that world, does it ever possibly pick back up? Like do a second edition kind they of thing? They do, um, but I don't think Inco Press would do that on this book just because, um, well, print is really struggling. Pr uh, public publication is really struggling. And, and I know that Ginkgo has felt it really badly. And that's unfortunate because they've been, you know, past going on 30 years now, probably been an incredible institution for art books. But um, it was, I think, I believe I was told it was the most expensive book they ever made. Mm. So, And it was the biggest print run they ever did uh -huh. to try and keep that cost down. 
So if they did it again, it would, it would cost them a lot. And if, mm. and if they didn't do a huge print run again, it would cost the consumer a lot. Yeah. So I, I don't know how that would work out. Pr publishing would have to, to take off again. Yeah. Yeah. Which I hope it would. I feel like, you know, in the, in the photography world, a lot of people are starting to self publish yeah. a lot of, you know, more pho photographic books of their work and thing with InDesign on the dope. Like you can, yeah. I mean, it's not going to be as polished as, you know, an actual, you know, per, you know, production, you know, hard copy, although you can, you can do, hard do hards, copies, but you know, yeah. it's not, it's not going to have that font, that polished feel, but that's kind of like the, it's like that underground thing again. Right. It is. And it's, it's cool that that is, is an option. And, um, I personally would love to see a publisher start up. It's an American made publisher that does it all here. Mm. I, I think that would be a real, uh, because consumers are getting savvy to that. You know, and I, I've been pushing that narrative a lot to buy things made here. Yeah. And that, uh, there aren't a lot of options for, for books on that level here. And so if somebody started one up, it may, it may catch on. Nice. People nice. may care enough to do that. Well, I, like I said, it was a very profound thing for me to find. Um, I, it was what I was looking for at the right time, you know, oh, when man. it got laid in front of me. So, Thank you. um, I got plans and I'll talk to you about it afterwards, but it's like, it's inspiring. It, it's something that I want to honor yours in the way that it's done for me. Well, I appreciate you know, that, man. And, and, and a lot of, and hopefully it, I know a lot of people that have the book and I've been talking about it relentlessly on the podcast for the last six months. So well, that's probably um, why it sold out. <laughs> no, well, I don't know about <laughs> that, but uh, it, it, you know, if people can find their hands on that and not just yours, but anybody within this motorcycle culture of the last 30 years, it's, took the time to make things like that. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, Tim O'Keefe, who we were yeah. talking about his, his publications are awesome. And I know, um, Mark Kirkland's been printing his own stuff and, yeah. and selling that too. Like, yeah, get, it's so worth it. Yeah. It's, I mean, if I could have, yeah, I've, I've got every stag and you know, the, the, the few of what he did with the few, the few I have yeah. that. Is he not doing that anymore? I think he's just in a, he, taking I a think, break. I think he's looking for the next inspiration for him right now. So, yeah. um, I really don't know and I don't want to assume at all, you know, but he's, he's an artist, man. And whatever he decides to do, it'll, it's going to have that Tim O'Keefe flavor. I love that. I'm excited for it. So yeah, Tim, get on it, man. We're all dying to know <laughs> what you do next. <laughs> all right. Well, Todd, thank you again. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to cross some paths quite a bit more in, Absolutely. in our lives. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Right, thank you. Thanks. Big thank you to Todd for giving my wife and I the opportunity to spend the better part of the day with him, record this episode and ask countless questions. It was the perfect way to top off our West Coast trip. Guys, please take a moment to check out our sponsors in the description below of this podcast. No matter where you're listening to it at, it's down below. You can also find a link to our Patreon in the description where you can join and gain access to our new podcast series called Garage Talk. We release new episodes every Wednesday and our latest ones feature Loudmouth Devin, Corey from Main Drive Cycle, Craig from the Down South Camp Out, as well as Rennie from Easy Rider Cycle. Join our Patreon community, get access to the group chat, make new friends, and get behind the scenes glimpse of the fast life. Come on, guys. So this was the last podcast for February, but this week on Garage Talk, we have our T-Bar Tuesday operator torqued up tray. And next week, we're bringing you Jaden, aka Dragon. In March, we're coming back with a bang. We've got Robert Cheek in the Dry County Moto, the Whiskey Boys and the Fast Life Camp Out, followed by the podcast we were making on the road trip to Milwaukee. Don't forget to tune in. I appreciate you all listening. And for those of you attending Mama Tried, we'll see you guys there. Peace.